Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show, where we're going to be taking a look at um, religious apologetics and how they talk about meta ethics, particularly um, subjective, subjective ethical ethical theories or um, subjectivist theories or anti realist theories. And so this is going to be kind of like a live react with Lance, I guess, because he's someone who's really interested in this area, has a lot of good things to say about it, um, and I think also gets upset when people kind of misrepresent the views as well. So. Um, I think this could be cathartic for him. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you want to say anything to open Lance about how you? Because you, I mean, you're not particularly interested in this from the point of view of like being religious or anti-religious or anything like that. You're, you're. I think. I mean, tell me if if I'm misrepresenting you. Interested in this from the point of view of like the meta ethical questions. And so I think then you come along and you see the way that it's talked about by apologists, and you're like, hang on, this is very different to the way I think about it as an anti-realist. You're muted, by the way. Um, <laughs> Good to be muted when you start. Yeah, so that's right. Uh, that's perfectly accurate. My primary concern is with accurately representing the meta-ethical landscape, so to speak. I also come at it from a psychological perspective because one of the most common things that people will say is that people will make these generalized claims like everybody's a moral realist, everybody's a this. And those straight these empirical claims and you know, I think the appropriate way to investigate those questions is to appeal to empirical evidence, but often people don't and they make assumptions about the meta ethical positions people have or that they presume people have without really doing the work to investigate so so maybe i mean to to establish our conclusion before we even go through any of the videos maybe one of the things that might come out of this video is something like that the the actual um questions that meta ethics kind of poses well the answers to those questions are sort of more complicated and nuanced than maybe the kind of case that's made by apologists, which kind of is going to state, well, look, it's just so obvious that kind of realism is right. And, you know, all that um, subjectivists or anti-realists have to say is like these kind of hand wavy responses or whatever. And I think we're going to we're going to kind of hopefully um, be able to present the case a little bit better. Like what would an anti-realist or a subjectivist have to say about some of these objections and responses? Yeah, that, that that's right. I, would, I, I want to make a note, though, which is that, you know, Christian apologists, I don't know what apologists from other, like, I don't know, I'll just say Christian apologists. Uh, yeah, other they'll often way. take, yeah, they'll take realism as a kind of given or as something that's intuitive or obvious. Now, you know, that might seem like something that they're, they're just pulling out of nowhere, but this is actually the standard view within academic philosophy in general. It's not like philosophy of religion or theologians in particular that presume realism is a type of default position. This is actually the standard view among secular moral philosophers that work within metaethics. They still will say things to like, you know, as early as last week, well, they'll say uh, most, the vast majority of people are moral realists. So, and, and moral realism is obvious or it is the default position. And, you know, this goes far enough to say that there's, there's something of a, a presumption in favor of realism is the standard view within the fields that focus on this, including uh, people that specialize in metaethics. So yeah, they're not, the, the apologist side is in a certain sense, accurately representing the, the sort of secular philosophical angle that's typically taken on it. Yeah, yeah, I see. So the first video then, let me uh, bring it up, is three strong arguments against moral subjectivism. So this has, it, this is from 2019. So I mean, it might not represent Cameron from capturing Christianity's views accurately anymore, but it has 30,000 views, um, which is fairly large for the kind of apologetic space. Um, so real, gonna... real quick before we get started on this one, this is one that I did see already. Um, so this one, I won't be able to provide a candid reaction to because I've listened to it at least once or twice. Uh, but whatever else you've got, I don't know what it is. Yeah, I mean, we'll see, because I, I suspect that anything I'll bring out, you've probably seen already. But It's, it's possible you find stuff I haven't seen. So we'll see. Okay. Yeah, just let me know if you want me to pause. Actually, I'll um I'll put this window by the side of the other one so I can see what's happening in both. Okay. Hey guys, it's me, Cameron Bertuzzi, here with three strong arguments against moral subjectivism. So this view might be popular like online and in certain atheist circles, but ethicists have known that Moral subjectivism actually faces some pretty serious issues. So let's start by just... So I don't know if you want to say anything just about that, because that's kind of fr framing it already as though it's a kind of fringe view 
that unanimously everyone kind of views this position as having you know be, being kind of laden with all these problems so if you if you're going to adopt it it's kind of unattractive or something yeah uh, that again probably is fairly accurate as far as people in meta ethics and philosophy in general go if you look at the anti-realist positions that philosophers do endorse and so there's this this survey from a couple of years ago the phil papers 2020 survey they found that 62 percent of philosophers endorsed moral realism and only about 25% endorsed anti-realism. There's another question in that survey that breaks down the different realist and anti-realist uh, camps. And within anti-realism, for some reason, they didn't seem to give this option, like something like individual subjectivism. So it's not surprising that people didn't select it. It literally was an option. You would have had to type it in. But I still have the impression that in general, uh, a lot of the anti-realist philosophers would not favor a type of individual subjectivism, like what he's going to talk about. I don't know. I don't remember if he talks about cultural relativism as well. But uh, other views would be error theory, non-cognitivism, quasi-realism. There's a, there's a variety of anti-realist positions that are not subjectivism, and those may take up such a big chunk of that 25% of, of anti-realists that the amount of subjectivists in particular is probably very small indeed. So it, pro it probably is an uncommon view. It's at least a minority view. It's probably quite uncommon, but I wouldn't say it's a fringe view. That, that seems a little weird. Like it is a recognized position. It is something you would see in a textbook that's discussing metaethics. And there, it would be surprising if there weren't capable contemporary philosophers that in, endorse the view. I, yeah, I think that's maybe where what Cameron's saying is sort of sounding funny to me because, I mean, there are positions I strongly disagree with, like I, I just think are really wrong, like panpsychism or substance dualism about mind, for example. But it doesn't mean that, you know, like I, I think the people who disagree with me, uh, obviously there's people who disagree with me who also haven't thought about it very much, but there's a lot of people who disagree with me who are either epistemic peers or epistemic superiors. They've thought about it a lot more. They have a lot more to say about my own position and their position than I do. And just because they're in a minority is something in philosophy. I mean, I I wouldn't want to paint it just as like being bizarre and fringe because there's, there's always going to be, as long as it's defended by someone at a high level, there's probably going to be someone with something, you know, good to say about it, or at least they're internally consistent. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, ju just going off of that note, to, to my knowledge, so I, I defend a, an account of descriptive metaethics uh, indeterminacy, which, as far as I know, the only person that's really written about this is Michael Gill in one paper, Indeterminacy and Variability in Metaethics. And he doesn't really push indeterminacy to the exclusion of variability. It's a little complicated to get into that. But basically, as far as I know, I'm like the one defender of a particular view, right. like where I'm, all my cards are like, all, I guess I could say all my eggs are in that particular basket. I don't know of a single other person like that. So you could say I have a fringe view fringe, because I'm yeah. the only person that has the view. Uh, there, there are probably people that have the view and they haven't published on it, written about it. So if but it you, doesn't mean you, you don't know, have good things to say about it, right? Because I think like, it, you know, a lot of people seem to think who disagree with you even think I want to talk to Lance because he's got some interesting things to say about um, meta ethics and so forth. Right. Well, we don't want to cleave too much to philosophy being a discipline for which the positions that people take, if a majority of people take a position, it's like a settled matter. Philosophy is the kind of thing where, first of all, just constitutionally, it's the sort of thing for which these different sorts of arguments are intended to remain open questions in a certain respect, there might be, you know, I mean, there's people that believe in contradictions they are like totally fine. Uh, so you will always find somebody defending a view. Basically what I, what I would want to say about this is that what you should not do is lean too heavy on a majority of philosophers endorsing the position or even a strong consensus. Even if 95% of philosophers endorse a position, that's not the same, that doesn't have the same kind of like truth tracking force that I would say would be the case for physics or chemistry or biology, because the the methods in philosophy are a lot foggier and up for grabs. I mean, for one thing, you have philosophers that are hypercritical of the underlying meta philosophy or the methodology used by the mainstream analytic philosophers themselves. So there's people that would toss out most or even all of the entire framework and you know, like someone like Wittgenstein, I would Wittgenstein's not fringe, and and yet there's entire approaches to philosophy that are hypercritical of the methods. You're not going to get substantive camps within science, at least to my knowledge, that are like fundamentally at odds with the entire methodology. Uh, like you're not, you don't have like this. Twenty percent of astronomers have this completely different method. They don't use telescopes. They use, you know, they read tea leaves. Like that's not a part of astronomy as a, as a scientific discipline. Okay.
Okay. So t- 20 seconds of um, video to 10 minutes of commentary. So we're on good. <laughs> <laughs> laying out what the view is. Individualist moral subjectivism, it's a mouthful, is the view that our moral claims are really just descriptions of our preferences. So for example, when someone says abortion is wrong, they're really just saying, I disapprove of abortion. And on this view, and this is really important, moral claims are still true or false. So if the description of the preference is accurate, like if they actually have that preference, then the moral claim is true. But the important part here is that moral claims are still true or false. Moral subjectivism is sometimes confused with a view called emotivism. Emotivism is the view that our moral claims just reduce- I don't know if you want to speak to the first point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so at this one I could make very brief. He says uh, subjectivism is is confused with emotivism. I don't know who's confusing these two. I've actually never, like I've encountered lots and lots of confusions about different meta-ethical positions. It would, it would, it wouldn't surprise me if that one has come up, and I haven't noticed a whole lot of it. But that's maybe he I means amongst apologists, though, rather than philosophers. Okay, you know, maybe. Like maybe he means it, it like in his circles, sort of thing. It could be fair enough. Yeah, he could be referring to a different r- group of people, and the misunderstanding is quite. It's understandable why someone would conflate the two because subjectivism is saying that moral claims are true or false depending on your moral standards, your preferences, as he puts it. That's fine. Uh, and then emotivism is saying that moral claims aren't true or false. They're just expressions of of your emotions. So like murder boo, pretty similar, actually, in, in a certain light. Uh, there are there's like a major difference in that one treats moral claims as propositional, one doesn't. But in terms of of how they function, they're 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 focused on the attitudes, the values, the preferences, the feelings of specific individuals. You know, they deny moral realism. Yeah, so relative to the things. individual. And that's mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, not going to give him too much of a hard time about that uh, because it could be that there are people that do mix them up. Mixing them up isn't that unusual, but just I haven't encountered it a whole lot. I think there's there's a funny sort of sense in which um, you know you talk about the the truth aptness of of moral claims on the moral subjectivist theory because it's like it it's true that I believe it right, um, but it's also true on objectivism that I believe what I believe sort of thing, um, because that that's kind of that's sort of tautologous so it's not it's not clear to me what the truth aptness is actually doing on the subjectivist theory you know like if you're just saying it's true i believe it it's not it's not clear to me that it's it's like lend that the subjectivist thinks that that is lending their um claim the same kind of like gravitas or something that maybe the you know the realist thinks that that truth aptness is giving their their cognitivist position yeah that is a good point so we could we could stop and and think about that for a moment. So there's, you can kind of make this distinction between a a sort of minimalist conception of a subjectivist view, and this would be true of any relativist view, where basically it has the sort of semantic thesis where moral claims have this sort of implicit indexical element. They are true or false relative to some frame of reference, typically the standards of people or groups. And so, you know, that's not, that might sound really technical and weird, but we use indexical terms all the time. Like if I say, I am Lance. It's true if I say it. It's false if you say it. So I said it after I, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, um, that term, it, it means it refers to me when I say it and it refers to you when you say it. So a, like the, it's the same structure, but actually what it's referring to changes in accordance with who the speaker is. And the minimal version of subjectivism would just treat a claim like murder is wrong the same way. Murder is wrong. You could sort of translate it. That would mean something like if I say it, murder is inconsistent with Lance's moral standards. And if you say it, it would be like it murder is inconsistent with Nathan's moral standards. And so the who it's referring to is, is different. And because in principle, we could have different moral standards, then the standards it's referring to can vary. Now, that's all that's doing is it's describing like what people are doing when they make certain sorts of utterances. Uh, that doesn't carry with it any additional normative implications. So, you know, I could then, it, it doesn't follow that if my if murder is inconsistent with my moral standards that this like creates this ethereal oughtness in the universe that then like compels me to act in accordance with my own standards so but you sometimes get and i i I, william lane craig does this in some of his descriptions and the way he frames relativism i don't have specific quotes we can pull them up uh so i could back up this claim that william lane craig does this but he often treats relativism as though it sort of generates these sort of oughts almost as though the stance dependent moral facts generate stance independent moral facts just in virtue of like you having the attitude or preference and then somehow you're bound by those and then they because they're different for different people different people are bound by these different floating stance independent facts it's a it so it's almost like um 
imagining that there's a type of of like variable realism that floats on top of and is generated by the anti-realist subjectivist view. It's it's very strange. I don't think of subjectivism and relativism that way. I don't think that they generate the kinds of aughts that have the kind of oomph or force or, or compulsion power that I think realists want to get out of stance independent moral facts. Because because that's the way I sort of see realists sometimes arguing against subjectivism. So there's this idea that because um, this type of subjectivism is still a cognitivist view that like it, it, it's sort of like a, a desideratum for a theory to have like true factness about the propositions or something because that gives you this kind of gravitas or something so then they're gonna say but you like you really don't you don't really get the gravitas though like I, like you do in a realist theory um, but it's not clear to me that the subjectivist actually wants to have that gravitas in the same sense that the realist wants it. You know, I generally think I, I suspect that most relativists would not want it, and that they're not making they're not making this sort of claim about what you're obliged to do independent of your goals or values. I don't think that they're they're trying to do that. Uh, it's it's funny though because realists will sometimes want to have their cake and eat it too because they will both suggest that there's something empty and arbitrary and that relativism lacks the kind of force that realism has. But then when they're framing the relativist's point of view, they'll say, well, if you're a relativist, you cannot object to a person with different values. I, sh I should say subjectivist. So like if someone comes up to you and they're like, I'm going to punch you and take your wallet, you can't object. You're just, you're not allowed to because they have different values. And the presumption there is that some, for some reason, as a subjectivist, you have to respect their values. But that, what if that's not one of your values? Like, I don't have to have the value that I must respect other people's moral values. So, especially when this, they want to steal from you. <laughs> sure, but there's this assumption that the the subjectivist actually has a normative moral position where they think not only that they have to follow their moral standards, but everyone else has to follow their moral standards, and the subjectivist somehow has to respect or like be permissive towards or enable or whatever, stand aside, be indifferent to other people acting in accordance with their moral standards, even if they conflict with the subjectivists. And this is simply not true. It is just false. That's a normative stance. It's not a meta ethical stance. I can have the subjective moral stance. Everyone on earth should follow my moral standards. And if they don't, you know, I I'm going to judge them and, and, you know, try to criminalize other people's behavior. Nothing about subjectivism requires a specific normative stance of how to treat others. So realists, uh, uh, I don't know if it's just apologists or realists in general, will, will often sort of a Try to make these two arguments and i don't know that i've seen one make them back to back but there is a tension between them if not an outright inconsistency okay so let's go the on. important part here is that moral claims or motivism is the view that our moral claims just reduce to expressions of emotion so when someone says abortion is wrong they're really just expressing an emotion like abortion boo and so on this view moral claims are not actually true or false just like if i said chocolate ice cream yuck like, that's not true or false. I think what the confusion is, though, that gets made um, sort of like straw manning emotivist or something is then that, that supposing emotivism is true, like people wouldn't say things like it's true that abortion is wrong. You know, like it's just that then in terms of look, when you try and um, see what the theory actually says about that kind of conflict of interest or whatever, that it's just people what, what people are using the language in that way to express their dissatisfaction or whatever. But it's not really true that. Because then there's this kind of reductio of like, but people say all the time that abortion is wrong. So like they don't, you know, they don't go like abortion. And that's just, you know, a, a kind of oversimplification of what the emotive is claiming. Right. I'm just expressing an emotion in a language that you guys can understand. And since these two views are radically different, they require their own refutations. So if you're interested in a refutation of emotivism, then check out the blog post that I've posted in the description, Individualist Moral Subjectivism. The first argument is that moral subjectivism can't account for genuine moral disagreement. So it goes like this, premise number one, if moral subjectivism were true, then there would be no genuine moral disagreement. Premise number two, there is genuine moral disagreement. The conclusion, therefore, moral subjectivism is not true. Okay, so I'll pause it here if you just want to briefly say what you think about is this argument. genuine moral disagreement uh, the conclusion we go. this is this is a bit of a tricky one it might be the better one out of the set of these adequately assessing these sorts of things requires getting into what's really going on when people engage in everyday discussions and discourse so i would start by saying that there's a general approach in analytic philosophy, like the discipline that typically discusses these sorts of issues in metaethics, that focuses heavily on toy sentences and addressing language in this sort of abstract, non-empirical way. 
So philosophers will say things like, well, you know, if subjectivism were true, like, so the rationale behind this is something like this. So if when I say murder is wrong, all I'm saying is I disapprove of murder. And when you say murder is wrong, all you're yeah. saying, let's we're say- like, you know, hermetically sealed uh, kind of worlds talking past each other that we're not like genuinely disagreeing. Right. It's just two ships passing in the night. So it'd be like if I, it, like imagine this kind of debate, like um, if I, when I say vanilla ice cream is d delicious, I mean something like I find it delicious. It would be weird for you to go, no, you're mistaken. I find chocolate ice cream delicious. Right. Yes, what would be, yeah, yeah. Like what? What would that even mean? <laughs> like there's not a disagreement. You're just telling, I'm telling you my preferences. You're telling me yours. It would be as ridiculous as if I said, I am Lance. And you go, no, I am not Lance. Like it <laughs> right. would, yes, that, yeah, yeah. that would be, that would not make any sense. And so what this argument is trying to show is if the, if the, the subjectivist has the proper an, like analysis of the semantics of moral statements, then the fact that people engage in moral disagreement, which they apparently do, would be incomprehensible. It wouldn't make any sense. Now, the pro there's a problem I have with this is that people disagree about things all the time where if you ask them, they would say, yeah, I don't think there's an objective fact. So like, you know, this is something I frequently ask people that would make this kind of argument is I say, have you ever left a movie? And then one person says the movie's great. One person says the movie sucked. Or you go out to dinner and one person goes, this food is good. Oh, no, it's terrible. And people will debate about the food. Now, if you stop those people and said, hey, hold up. And then you explained like a gastronomic realism or cinematic realism to them. And then cinematic subjectivism. I would bet, I'll bet whatever you like, that most of those people would not favor cinematic or gastronomic realism they would say no i'm a subjectivist or an emotivist or whatever some kind of anti-realist about these things and so when they're engaged in those debates there's a few things that could be going on that do not support realism indirectly uh but rather so like it, it, at least a couple of things that could be going on one when people engage in these kinds of, of disagreements there's often a presumptive intersubjective standard they could be operating within a shared framework. So disagreements certainly can occur if I'm assuming you have similar or, or, or overlapping standards with me, and then we're, I'm disagreeing over the non-moral considerations, or I'm thinking that you're confused or mistaken about some moral consideration that you haven't thought through, given that we have some shared standard. So people will argue, for instance, within the framework of the law, like, is this legal? Is this not legal? Um, even if on reflection, they might recognize that the legal system there's not an there there isn't in a certain sense an objective fact of the matter about what the law is but there isn't an objective sense. fact of the matter <laughs> right of what the law is independent of our deciding or agreeing that that's what the law is so in a certain sense the law is is constructed and I, you could take a subjective like the law is whatever we want the law to be once we agree on the law, then there's an objective fact about what the law is that we've agreed but it's on. It's not like we're discovering we, it in the world by right. <laughs> the more we But then we could disagree about about the contents of that. So there could be implicit intersubjective standards that are presumed in the course of a disagreement. That's one factor. The other factor is that when people are disagreeing, they're not necessarily trying to say like when ordinary people are running around making art, like engage in debates and making claims and these sorts of things. It's not like people are are these are just robots that are just like, I am trying to optimize for truth. I will only say what is true. That's not what people are doing. A lot of what people are doing when they're disagreeing with one another is social. So they're trying to signal, look how good I am. I'm a good and righteous person. So you can look at, a, um, there's a book on a moral grandstanding. I think it's called Moral Grandstanding uh, that talks about this sort of thing where people will, will sort of, um, and this is very common in politics, but people will sort of take a stance and sort of present themselves as being outwardly morally good. Uh, in order to gain sort of social credit. This is something that just people do. So people have social agendas when they're making moral claims. And the same is true in all these other sorts of normative and evaluative interactions. People are, they might wanna show off, look how cool I am, look how sophisticated I am. People arguing over, you know, is this the best movie of all time? And people, you know, there's this bias where people wanna say that, like for instance, people really wanna say that these certain old movies are good. I've never seen an old movie that I've liked, not one. I think they're all terrible. I don't like them. I think the acting is typically terrible. It's low definition, black and white. I, I, the, it's it's awkward and stilted. No, new movies are better. Um, I, so like uh, for me, you know, because so, I'm a subjectivist about movies, but I'll, look what I said, new movies are better. And I'm prepared to argue with someone about this. Does that, does that mean I'm a realist about movies? No. So when people are arguing, they have various sorts of, of things that they may want to indicate about their characteristics and qualities. And this notion that disagreement is purely 
about trying to, to converge on the truth is just absurd and it's not based on an actual empirical assessment of what people are doing when they disagree with one another. So that's that's two things. One is intersubjective standards and then one is these other sorts of social goals. There's more to say on this, but the bottom line is it could just turn out empirically if we went out and we looked at what people are doing when they disagree, that those people are both speaking like subjectivists or at least not realists. And um, the, so they're both speaking that way and it's the case that they're engaged in these sorts of disagreements. So the disagreements are real and they don't imply realism. So, so I'm just thinking about the argument as it's been given, right? So suppose that you're thinking about matter ethics and you're thinking, wow, this moral subjectivism, it actually seems to pretty accurately capture the way that I think that um, moral discourse works. And then all of a sudden you think about premise one, you think, well, if, if moral subjectivism is true though, then a consequence of that is that there's no genuine moral disagreement. So then if you sort of think those two things, then you're going to be you're you're going to think that the consequent right of that conditional is true if you believe the conditional and you're a moral subjectivist. So in that case, you're just going to reject two, right? Um, you're just going to say, well, there is no genuine moral disagreement in that sense because I think the theory is true and I think that the conditional is true in the first place. Um, and then you might uh, otherwise, you know, you might just reject the conditional because you might say, well, there is genuine moral disagreement, but as in you accept premise two, but then you just mean something slightly different. Um, you you mean you mean something slightly different, so you'd re reject the, um, the the conditional premise. So I'm kind of, you know, like I don't I don't think that putting this in this argument form necessarily helps to clarify. I, I don't know. Maybe you disagree with me. Maybe you think that it, well, at least it sh it shows you what like it's consistent to believe and what what it's inconsistent to believe. So it helps the discourse in that sense because maybe you can kind of figure out. Um, where you've got an inconsistency, but I think I think all we can say is that like there's just an in, I, there's either a consistent or an inconsistent set of claims, right? And it's not like saying well this is the argument form it means it like weighs in favor of one view or the other. It just kind of shows you what it's consistent to believe if you're a subjectivist and what it's consistent to believe if you're not a subjectivist. Yeah, yeah that seems fine. I I think that these kinds of formal arguments are useful in just clarifying and regimenting our positions. Uh, one thing I would say is that I, I don't actually think subjectivism is the correct description of what people are typically doing when they make moral claims in the first case, uh, in the, sorry, in the first place. So I wouldn't buy in to the notion that people speak like subjectivists. But one one thing to keep in mind here is that the the this question, like many questions in metaethics, sorry, many sorts of arguments in metaethics, sort of just presupposes that there's this sort of uniform fact of the matter about what people are doing when they make moral claims. And so it could just be that sometimes when people make moral claims that they are speaking like subjectivists and sometimes they're not. And that some people speak more like subjectivists and sometimes and some people don't. And so this type of of analysis sort of bakes into it the notion that there's this just this flat, uniform way of accounting for what's going on when people make moral claims. There probably are cases where people are arguing with one another about morality. And then they realize that they just have different, fundamentally different perspectives, and they don't think people with different perspectives are wrong. And then they go, "Oh, well, in that case, whatever." I mean, this is something that that philosophers themselves will often complain about: are student relativists? Do they not think people's conversations ever bottom out, and people just saying, "Let's agree to disagree," or "I don't think you're mistaken." I, like again, like wh whether or not this happens and how often it happens is an empirical question. So. The fact that some, like, of course, some people disagree about moral issues, uh, and and I would think at least some people's moral disagreements are genuine. But which people? How often? Under what circumstances? In what context? Using what language? These are all difficult, messy, empirical questions that would require us to actually engage in the relevant type of empirical research to get a sense of to to sort of quantify how often and under what circumstances these sorts of disagreements occur. The presumption here just seems to be that if there's any at all, some un under unspecified amount, that therefore subjectivism is false. Like what? That there's just this. It's too neat. It's too tidy. It's failing to appreciate the messiness of the way language actually works. Okay, uh, let's play then, on a bit. Are really just descriptions of our preferences? Then there actually can't be any moral disagreement. So think about it like this. Joe says abortion is wrong, and Sally says abortion is right. So let's translate these moral claims. Joe is saying, I disapprove of abortion, and Sally is saying, I approve of abortion. So the point I was saying about 
how how someone could reject the conditional is they could just say no that that's what i mean by genuine moral disagreement right so then they'd accept the second premise they'd say there is genuine moral disagreement and but they'd reject that if moral subjectivism is true then there's no genuine disagreement because they think there is genuine disagreement and this is just what i mean by it that's one way that someone might think about it yeah and you that i think is a completely appropriate way and i think it it sort of takes the argument right out. So they would they could just deal with it that way. So they could just say, yeah, this case here, I disapprove of abortion, I approve of abortion, is a disagreement. Now, it's a disagreement not about, say, what the moral facts are. It's a disagreement about, say, what the law should be or how we ought to coordinate our actions. So if, you know, you and I, let we get stranded on a desert island. I've got all the water on my side of the island. You got all the coconuts on your side of the island. I need food or I'm going to die. You need water or you're going to die. And I say, hey, I'll give you like one pitcher of water for four coconuts. And you go, no, 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 I'll give you just three. Uh, we might have a disagreement. There's not an objective fact of the matter about what's true. Our disagreement concerns right. yeah. the coordination of actions. And when people are engaged in moral disputes, these are not disputes about like, is a particular type of frog in this particular genus or something like that? Or, you know, what what is there a, another isotope that we haven't found out about a particular element? It's not the some, moral particle. <laughs> yeah, it's not necessarily, it's not. It, it's often not some mundane fact we don't care about. It's a fact that influences our conduct, the conduct of the people around us, what policies and laws we favor. It has practical significance. It's the same thing, like, here's another example, like an everyday example. You and some friends are gonna order some pizza. You gotta figure out what toppings to get on the pizza. Like, you know, one person's like, I want anchovies on the pizza. Another person, I want mushrooms and people disagree. There is a disagreement. Is there an objective fact of the matter about what the correct toppings to get are? That would be a, a very weird presumption to make. And so. You're, I think that you're right, and this is a really good move that a subjectivist could make, is to just say, look, what might look superficially like a disagreement over objective facts is actually just a disagreement over what sort of normative policies we should agree on, and people could just disagree on what those policies ought to be. It's, it, in other words, it comes down to a normative disagreement that has no implications, like it's just perfectly possible without a realist framework. And it just, and the point is that we could give clear examples of this happening in everyday life pretty easily. So why would we think that moral disagreements couldn't be of the same form? And this kind of, I, I think that all of this sort of loops back to within the kind of grander points about, grander, the meta points about um, the, the role and purpose of arguments, right? Because it's kind of like, suppose it, suppose that, um, you know, I, I, know, I don't think either, either of those aren't really like moral subjectivists, but suppose, you know, we were, we just went, moral subjectivism is true. And then Cameron goes, moral subjectivism isn't true, right? Then, uh, and then he goes, therefore I win. You, we kind of all be like, well, well, no, you hang on. You've just, you just stated that you don't agree with the kind of conclusion there, right? But um, that's not like a legitimate move to make. You've not like won some, some argument or some debate or something. So kind of why is it then that if you just introduce two premises that, that the conjunction of which entail, you know, the, the kind of disputed claim, one of which the other person rejects and then you go i've won afterwards why is that like a more of a legitimate move to make and it's like it, it it's sort of strange what these arguments are actually supposed to be doing like we should we should kind of look at that and as just as suspect as if someone just kind of um you know negated um our position and then just said yeah therefore i win because there's more to do with these arguments than just kind of make them in the, in this way but does Joe actually disagree with Sally? Actually, no. Joe would reason like this. I disapprove of abortion, and I agree that Sally approves of abortion. Likewise, Sally would say, I approve of abortion, and I agree that Joe disapproves. So on this view, as long as everyone is telling the truth, there actually isn't any disagreement. But this is all really, really strange, right? If you're pro-choice and you go into a debate with a pro-lifer, you're not going into this debate assuming that the two of you agree. Moral debate assumes disagreement, at least in I think the question here is, um, so presume, you know, presumably the moral realist is also going to say that they're going to say like, you know, you could, you'd be a moral realist and you'd say, well, I think that um, abortion is right, but um, you know, Sally thinks abortion is wrong. Like they're not going to deny the other person's beliefs just because they think there's a fact of the matter. The question is, um, what's the best way to model that disagreement? Right? Is it to commit ourselves to this new kind of fact, which is what's actually being disagreed about? Or is it to maybe be like subjectivists and as, as we were just suggesting before, maybe talk about the disagreement in terms of like pe people think we should coordinate actions differently. And that's where the disagreement is rather than over, you know, true propositions or something.
Yeah, just to often what I do is I just comment on other people's stuff. So I should I could just put my cards in the table and say what I think about this. So I and I already mentioned this that I advocate indeterminacy about this. So when people are disagreeing about these sorts of things, I don't think there's a meta ethical fact of the matter about what they're doing. I don't think they're subjectivist or realist or any of these sorts of things. I mean, sometimes some people are because they went out and they read some philosophy. But for the most part, when people are engaged in these sorts of disagreements, uh, these sorts of you could even just call them conflicts. When people have conflicts over what policies and laws and so on to favor. We don't need to have any meta ethical framework to make sense of what people are doing there. People just have conflicting goals and interests, and people want to achieve their goals and interests, and those conflict with other people's goals and interests. And when we're looking at that moral dispute, I think that we should understand it in terms of conflicts in the, you could say, the socio functional goals of competing individuals or groups. And the language in those cases is largely serving a sort of outwardly expressive or rhetorical purpose for people to try to persuade one another or to signal various sorts of qualities. Now that doesn't mean that the best analysis is an anti-realist analysis. It means that like, I, that might just be an inappropriate question to ask. So to give an example, if you're, if you're observing a teacher teaching a group of children how to do math, they're learning their times tables or something like that. I think it would be very bizarre to say, well, let's analyze the teachers, what the teacher is saying is the teacher a Platonist about mathematics or are they an anti-Platonist about mathematics? Let's keep analyzing their speech and thinking and like looking at examples. So the teacher said two plus two really is four. Ah, okay. So they look like they're a Platonist about math. That, that'd be ridiculous. It would it would be such a right, waste yeah. of time and such an absurd thing to do uh, that it would, it would just be, I, I would just be left incredulous if someone was trying to like study mathematics, like everyday mathematics discourse. And this is a point Michael Gill makes in his paper on indeterminacy. And he said, hey, maybe we should think the same thing about metaethics. Like, so why think that people, when people are, are arguing about abortion or whatever, that they're they're like trying to report facts in this way rather than trying to do something else? You know, that's yeah, something- like pe People that, disagree, like you said about cinema and stuff before, like where, where people disagree about whether it's a good film or not. So it's like ontologically committing or something, <laughs> yeah. In principle. So if you think that you can coherently have moral debates with other people, then you have to agree that there does exist genuine moral disagreement. And from the first two premises, it follows that moral subjectivism is false. The second argument against moral subjectivism is that it would render all of our moral judgments literally infallible. So let's look at this argument. Premise number four. If moral subjectivism were true, then all of our moral judgments would be infallible. Premise number five. Our moral judgments are not infallible, from which it follows the conclusion Therefore, moral subjectivism is not true. So moral sub I don't know if you, let me know if you want it to play out a bit more before commenting. Yeah, I, 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 could, I could say something about this, but do you have something to say about it? I was just going to say, I, I think that, you know, what, what is, oh, I guess he's put it as four because to try and distinguish them from the previous one, but, uh, so it just threw me off a bit. Um, pre but premise four here, which is the first premise in the argument, um, I, I just don't think that moral subjectivists are going to, to sign up to that. Like, yeah. You know, they're just going to have something to say about how people change their mind about about things over time, or it, what well, it depends what infallible means. Um, our moral judgments are not. It, There's, it's going to depend on how you interpret what these premises are actually saying about fallibility, right? Like infallible in the sense of you can never change your mind, or infallible in the sense that you can't be wrong that you believe them. Um, it's always going to be infallible in that sense, but then it doesn't have anything to say about moral realism. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just first, I, I think Cameron, especially if he does you know new videos where he uses this sort of thing, it'd probably help if he numbered the arguments, like argument number one, argument number two, and then use like premise one, premise two, and then use right. like, a, and like put like P1, P2, and then for the conclusions, put like C, and if he has multiple conclusions, C1, C2, whatever. Uh, just, you know, that would help the notation for people to be able to look at these and like move around and make sense of it. Um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't sign up for this if I were a subjectivist, because what I might say is that, look, this is relying on the presumption that people have perfect introspective access to their own moral standards and values. And I'm not sure that people do. People can actually be mistaken about their own standards and values. Uh, this is a point I make about my own writing. It's not published yet, but I make this comparison and I say, look, this is something that like we teach kids, like, and kids get it. Look at the book, Green Eggs and Ham, you know, that whole book, the character is saying, I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam, I am. They, they were mistaken. They did like green eggs and ham, and they literally didn't know it because they hadn't tried them. 
So they were operating on an assumption about what their own preferences were, and they were mistaken about what would be consistent with their own preferences. Now, that's a bit of a silly example, but my point in bringing up that example is that this is something that we recognize about people, that people can make assumptions about what is in their interests and not in their interests, and they could be mistaken about that. And it's the same thing with, with, let's say you're a subjectivist and a utilitarian and you want to maximize utility. You could think a particular policy or law would maximize utility and you're incorrect about that. And so if you're making a claim like, you know, we should have, you know, we should have this particular law. I, I don't know. I don't like giving a bunch of like really concrete examples that people are going to debate about. So I don't know. Uh, a law that changes like how many years you get in prison for, for murder or something like that. Uh, the, the utilitarian can just be mistaken about whether that particular thing would maximize utility or not. So then they're going out making a claim. And that claim, it, whether it's true or not, turns on certain non-moral empirical facts that they don't have direct personal access to. So they might be infallible in a certain limited sense with respect to their introspectively accessible values, but they might lack perfect introspective access to their values. And people will often make a lot of more concrete moral claims that could be in like false given certain non-moral considerations. So I just don't think a subjective yeah. that would buy into this account. I, I, I'm thinking, so, you know, supposing that infallible here means like um, can't be wrong about their own belief report or something, right? Um, well, then in that case, you know, the moral subjectivist is plausibly going to accept four, right? But then they're definitely going to reject five because X hypothesis, right? That's just not what they think. They think that our oh, moral judgments are fallible. So that so that's one way they're going to think about the argument and reject it, um, for sure. Yeah. One thing to say about this is I think that there's and and I hate to say this, but I think it's kind of a bit of a making a rhetorical move here. That's relying on an implied equivocation. So, and I think the implied equivocation is in five here, our moral judgments are not infallible. So if you understand a moral judgment just to be a self-report about your preferences, it's not, and let's just say, like, let's set aside questions of introspective access. If I say I like mushrooms on my pizza or something like that, it'd be really weird to say that like, okay, maybe I could be wrong about that, whatever, set that aside. Right. We'll just assume people are infallible about their, their preference reports. You could just look at like rewrite premise five in the way that the subjectivist is, is defending their position. Our reports about our moral preferences are are not infallible. Now that doesn't look so plausible. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I think it's relying on the notion, like, it, you know, some people would say- If you assume okay. realism and then you read five, you're gonna be like, yeah, five sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> like, exactly, but, exactly. Yeah. And so it's relying on this, this sort of duping the person reading the premise into equip like sort of themselves internally equivocating imagining five in isolation from the rest of what the subjectivist is saying because Seeing there is a is fact really that we disagree about and so that's why we're not fat <laughs> yeah right so it's almost relies on a sort of um smuggled it, it's relying on the audience to beg the question for the person presenting the argument it's it's subtle it's very cool that's a rhetorical trick. I don't like that. I don't like that that's, that's what gives this argument its force. I'm not saying that that's intentional in whoever designed this argument. What I'm saying is that I think that the appeal of the argument is derived from that sort of illicit dependence on the reader equivocating in their own minds. And that this may, this probably slipped past whoever presented this because they're looking at five in isolation and it looks good, but it's not if you're a subjectivist. Buy into the subjectivist framework and five, you know, translate it and it looks fine. And I, I suppose maybe um, maybe I should have let Cameron describe the defense of the premises to understand the relevant sense of infallible here. But I'm th I'm just thinking as I read the argument, there's another mate sense of infallible that could be meant, which would be something like um, to do with people changing their minds about their beliefs over time or something. Um, you know, like it, like like you'd never change. But, but maybe that's just a different argument that I'm thinking of. So I should. That would it. probably yeah. be different. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah. That seems like a stronger claim, or at least a, a sort of qualitatively different claim that I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to presume. I think this one has yeah. something to do with whether you're capable of being correct or not. In, yeah. In like right. a, like a, at time one, like it's not looking at the future. Yeah. Um. One thing I would say though is you could probably steel man this and make like a, a weaker argument, like weaker in the sense that it tones down the infallibility claim. You could just say something like. If moral subjectivism were true, then like it would be difficult for us to be mistaken about 
what we're morally correct or incorrect about, but it's actually pretty easy for us to be mistaken and that that's a problem for the subjectivist. I don't know that right. that would be some sort of decisive refutation of it, but someone might just say, look, it's it seems really weird to treat people as this sort of, uh, like to think that the ease of solving moral problems is just a matter of consulting your preferences. That doesn't seem to be the way that we think about and engage in moral philosophy when we're actually really taking it seriously. And so there's something kind of unserious about the subjectivist's engagement with moral dialectic. And again, not a decisive concern, but it is a concern that raises questions about like, oh, do we really want to buy into something that sort of, to a certain extent, could trivialize large portions of moral philosophy and reflecting on our moral standards? Subjectivism is not true. So moral subjectivism implies that any moral claim that you make, any honest one, is true. Here's an analogy that might help. If I honestly report to you that my favorite ice cream flavor is vanilla, then I can't actually be wrong about that. I mean, it could be lying, but so long as I'm- But this is what I mean by- uh, So imagine imagine you think this, right? Well, then you're just never going to accept that second premise that, you know, that that we are fallible about- our, So, so- you know, it's, it's just kind of strange to think that this is going to be a good argument for the against for the moral subjectivist. Maybe it's a good argument for the person who's a realist, right? Like they're going to go like, oh, yeah, now there's some new set of claims that I didn't know about that um, shows that some other theory that I disagree with is wrong. But it's not going to be um, a, a good argument to persuade the subjectivist. Yeah, it, it almost seems like he's buying into the idea that if like on the subjectivist view, yeah, you really would be infallible. And then if you buy into that, then when you look at premise five, it's not a problem at all. Like yeah. as you're saying, so what's the problem? So, and I think, again, I really think that's why any force that this gets comes from reading premise five, like through the lens of a realist. I mean, honest, then I can't be wrong. So similarly on moral subjectivism, if I honestly report to you that I disapprove of abortion, then I can't be wrong. This means that any honest moral claim that anyone makes is literally infallibly true. The obvious problem here is that it's extremely presumptuous to think that your beliefs about an entire area of discourse are literally infallibly true, especially about one is so nuanced and controversial. But the, but here's the claim that the subjectivist is making, right? The claim is making, uh, supposing that the, this is actually an accurate characterization of what they think, the claim they would be making is that you're um, infallible with respect to your own belief ascription, right? <laughs> and so, and that's all of a sudden, that's, that's not so, um, sort of, sort of arrogant, you know, like to be like, no, I am, it, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, if, if, if me and Lance are disagreeing with something and I'm kind of like insisting that he doesn't really believe what he believes. And then Lance goes, no, like, honestly, I really do believe that. I'm like, that's so arrogant of you, Lance, to think that, you know, your beliefs better than me. Or something. Yeah. Also just saying if he was arrogant, isn't an objection to it. Saying it's presumptuous isn't an uh, objection to it. Say, you know, saying that the person that's doing this is, is engaged in some type of epistemic overreach or doing something inappropriate doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that they're mistaken. Um, one thing that's weird about this is again, there seems to be this tension in both framing it as this view where it's like, Hey, we really are like, it's this simple thing. It's just what my preferences are. And we have access to that and we're infallible about it. And it's presumptuous. Well, is it in in what respect? In what respect? It's it's. I think he's it, assuming it, moral realism in his accusation there, because he's like the person thinks they infallibly have access to what the the realist facts are out there in the right. world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that seem that maybe that would be arrogant. What I think is funny though is that that's not something the subjectivist is doing. It is something the realist is doing. The realist will, many, many, many realists will say they're not sitting there thinking it's super duper difficult to figure out what all these objective moral facts are. They just got them right there. Intuition. It's just boom, intuitive. I know what the objective moral facts are. It's what I think they are. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's an, a point about moral realists is that they almost always think that the objective moral facts happen to fall exactly in line with their personal moral standards. Huh. Interesting. I think I think this is maybe a good way, actually, of J James put it. Like he's weaving in and out of inter an internal critique of uh, subjectivism. Yeah, I think I think that that's right, and I think that this is there's something very similar with many of the standard arguments that I see from realists. Is that typically there will be at least one premise when they use a sort of two premise conclusion style argument when they use these like really um, kind of simple ones like a modus modus ponens or something like that. Is that at least one of the premises will more or less just be just sort of smuggle in more, like almost like just realism is true like that's just what one of the premises is assuming or the premise at the very least is only is only palatable if you're a realist 
It, it's and kind that of like imagine it, every single one. <laughs> it, it's like it, it, if I made an argument, you know, like for um, a, against theism, that was like, well, if God exists, there is at least one God, um, but there are no gods, you know, like therefore God does not exist, or something like that. It's like. Well, look, if it, you know anyone who who signs up to the first premise just isn't going to accept that second one. Like, if 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 you actually think that God exists, there's no way you're going to go. Yeah, if God exists, it does follow that there is at least one God, and then you're going to look at the game, but there are no gods. Oh no, I've been duped. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I'll, just a lot of the realist arguments have this vibe. It's it's like they want to smuggle the realism in. It, it, through this uh, sort of Trojan horse premise, and it's going to be premise one or it's going to be premise two. I'm not saying they're all like that. I do think there's at least a few arguments that don't do that, but a lot of the ones I see are like that. As morality. Moreover, if everyone is literally infallible about morality, then atheists have to admit that every religious person's views ever have been infallibly correct. I'm going to let your... Again, that's a kind of... Um... You know, they, they don't mean infallibly correct in the objectivist sense. That's, you know, when he says the subjectivist is going to have to say every religious person has been infallibly correct. It's like, yeah, they've been subjectively infallibly correct. <laughs> like, not, they've not been correct about like these th facts about the way the world is or anything like that. Yeah. Just, just translated into his own example, and the whole thing looks silly. Everyone that's ever reported what their favorite ice cream flavor is that wasn't lying and was sincerely and genuinely doing so was correct. Yeah, you're gonna have to say people who like pistachio were correct. Like, <laughs> uh, like it, once you translate it, it just it doesn't. What's the problem? Your mind wander on that one, and so it follows from premises four and five that moral subjectivism is not true. So let's turn to the third argument. This one says that moral subjectivism is incoherent. It goes like this: premise number seven. If moral subjectivism were true, then there would be true contradictions. Premise number eight: there are no true contradictions. From there it follows, moral subjectivism is not true. So let's start first with the concept of a contradiction. Here's one. Cameron is a photographer, and Cameron is not a photographer. That sentence actually contains an explicit contradiction, so it can't be true. I can't be a photographer and not a photographer at the same time. Okay, so the idea behind the third argument is that our preferences are not always rational. So for example, suppose that Frank thinks that it's always wrong to eat meat, but then suppose that Frank has other preferences that would make eating meat morally acceptable, like his desire not to starve to death. Combining these preferences together, we arrive at Frank never approves of eating meat, and Frank sometimes approves of eating meat. So here's where... So th this argument, it sounds like it, it would be really easy to misrepresent it. And the idea has to be that there's someone who has beliefs, um, which are kind of like closed under entailment or something. And so there's an inconsistency that like the specific case to get the argument to work is that because the, their beliefs are closed under entailment, there are entailments of some of their beliefs that they're committed to, which then commit them to this kind of inconsistency. But then there's a problem here because if we're saying that um, it's true in virtue of what the person believes, then we're going to get these kind of contradictions. Where, but I, I mean, I let it play out, but I'm just not seeing how that's a problem. It seems like you just kind of point that out to Frank, and maybe he's got some like revision to do or something. But um, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> where it gets really interesting. Remember that our moral subjectivism, our moral claims are true or false descriptions of our preferences, and so long as those descriptions are accurate then the moral claim must be true. That's just what moral subjectivism is. So let's see what happens when we translate Frank's conflicting preferences into a moral claim. It is always wrong to eat meat, and it is not always wrong to eat meat. Moral subjectivism implies that this moral claim has to be true. Again, that's what the view is. However, this claim is obviously contradictory, and so it can't be true. Like, there's no possible world where this claim is true. This is a very, very serious problem. No human's moral preferences are perfectly rational. I mean, we all try to be like as rational as we can, but even professional philosophers have a difficult time weeding out little incoherencies in their beliefs. So unless we grant the really implausible premise that no one that's ever lived has had contradictory preferences about morality, then moral subjectivism implies that some contradictions are true. But since there obviously can't be any true contradictions, it follows that moral subjectivism is not true. All right, guys. Okay, feel free to come in. I'm just going to get the thingy up. Yeah, what do you what do you have to say about that? I think that's the most interesting out of this group. I, I do think it's interesting. I think it is kind of easy to um, misunderstand or misrepresent what he was saying, and it, it has to it has to be this kind of um, idea of the beliefs being. But it but I think that the problem here is the idea that people have contradictory 
beliefs right. And I think that in the actual world, people have contradictory beliefs all the time. So I'm not, um, I'm kind of struggling to see how it's a problem that sort of says there's like a true contradiction that exists or something. Um, maybe you could help me on that if I'm just not seeing something. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I would have to like really sit down and, th and, and think about this to, to like work out the technicalities of what I think is, is wrong with it. One thing I, that, like as a, as a first pass, is that I'm not sure. So if you're offering subjectivism as a semantic analysis of what people are doing when they make moral claims. So when a person says murder is wrong, they're saying murder is inconsistent with my moral standards. That can just be true. That could just be true that that is what people are doing. Now, one of the things people could do if that's what they're doing when they make moral utterances is have conflicting preferences or standards. I, would that make the, the, the semantic theory incorrect? I don't see how. How would it do that? It could just be true that the person's contradicting themselves. Uh, okay, how is yeah, the theory mis wrong? It's just that the person's mistaken. The person has conflicting or mistaken views. The fact that a theory says, here's what people are doing when they make moral claims, and then one of the things some of the people do when they make moral claims uh, do is to say contradictory things isn't an indictment of the theory. It's an indictment of the person. Uh, now, what you could say is that like the, the the relativist or the sorry, the individual subjectivist in this case is somehow committed to like if someone thinks both murder is wrong and murder is not wrong that it has to be true relative to that person both that murder is wrong and murder is not wrong simultaneously and that can't be true so therefore there's something wrong with relativism but i'm i'm not sure that that follows from that uh it, that seems like it, it seems like it once it, it's once again this attempt to sort of extract these extra normative facts out of what the the subjectivist is doing when trying to offer an analysis of what people are doing when they make moral claims. So so what Floyd has put here, I think, is one way of thinking about it, right? But I'm not, I, there's a reason I don't think this is right, which I'll, I'll try to articulate. So he's saying, you know, you might in, think about indexing it to claims that are made at particular times. So at one time, Frank, I think was the guy's name in the example, is saying, you know, he believes eating meat is, is right. And then at another, uh, or, um, it's always wrong to eat meat, or it's sometimes right to eat meat or whatever. And he's saying these things at different times. And it's like, well, there's no contradiction there because they're just indexed to different times. I think what the idea is, though, is that Frank has these beliefs simultaneously at the same time. Yeah. And so that's what yeah. introduces the, the, the fact that there's a conflict. And then, OK, so then maybe the way to think about it is in terms of like truth makers or something. So what on, on a subjectivist theory, what makes it true um, that what makes it subjectively true, I should say, because it's not obviously, but what makes it subjectively true that eating meat is wrong, according to Frank, well, it's his beliefs. But then, you know, I, th I think we, maybe we just say, yeah, Frank's inconsistent here, right? It, but it, does, it doesn't mean that we think there's like contradictory objects or something that exist in the world. It's kind of like, um, I mean, there's like this pu Kripke's puzzle um, about Pierre, right? Where Pierre's like a French speaker or something. And he has, you know, he sees all these posters in France that say like a, Londres S. Yoli or whatever. I don't speak French, so that's a horrible pronunciation. But that, that means like London is pretty. And then he moves to this place um, in England. And as he learns English, you know, he learns that this place is called London. And, you know, people are like, and he's like, oh, London's not very pretty. Um, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of garbage. There's a lot of trash around, or whatever. So now the idea is that as a French speaker, you, you know, um, Pierre is truly committed to this Londres place being uh, Yoli or whatever, which, and as an English speaker, he he affirms that, you know, London's not pretty. And the idea is like, well, how do you resolve this? And one of the ways of thinking about it is like, yeah, like, um, you know, Pierre's just inconsistent here. And other, you know, there's kind of maybe like, in t there's going to be a difference depending on basically whether you're an internalist or an externalist about these bit different bits of language about what's really going on. And maybe the same kind of moves can just be made by the moral subjectivist in terms of understanding how you make sense of this conflict in Frank's desire, uh, Frank's kind of um, belief descriptions. Yeah, I, so I, I, I guess what I would want to say about this is, is simply that the fact that you're offering a descriptive account of the meaning of moral claims that results in it being descriptively true that some people have contradictory sets of beliefs does not entail that the theory is false. It simply entails that some people have contradictory beliefs. Yeah, right. Some I just people don't want, see the problem yeah. with that. And then you could say, well, <laughs> well, maybe you wouldn't. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that maybe that there's like a f further step that you could make, right? And it's like, and then if, but maybe this is completely superfluous. 
um, you know, he ought to revise contradictions from his beliefs or something. It's like, well, if you say, if you think that now you're committed to realism or something, now there's like a true fact or something. But um, I, well, I mean, that's you Cameron could be said. a Humean constructivist and just say that the, the person is like committed to internal consistency and that is itself one of their subjective values. But, you know, it could just be a literal psych like look all all the the subjectivist has to do is just say this is what pe this is what moral claims mean or this is what people yeah, are doing when yeah. they're making moral claims any problems that follow from that that's a problem for people <laughs> like that's so like it can just turn out that people could just both have a like i mean first of all it it could be and i suspect is the case that people are sometimes ambivalent about something and i could both in a certain substantive and meaningful sense at the same time not at time one time two I could both sort of want to eat food and not want to eat food. So I could prefer to eat and not prefer to eat. I can have two conflicting preferences simultaneously. I think I'm capable of that psychologically. Like what, how, how would a theory, if a theory says I can have conflicting preferences, like contradictory preferences at the same time, uh, that could just literally be true about me. Is the theory false? How, why would the theory be false? Like it's literally a fact. So whatever account we want to make about reality, um, it is a fact about me that I have conflicting preferences. So we got to make we like that. That's going to be one of the one of the things that the theory would have to explain how it is the case that I have contradictory preferences because it just is. Uh, so a theory that fails to do that in a certain sense would be failing to explain certain like demonstrable psychological facts, assuming that I'm, I can infallibly report both that I prefer X and that I prefer not X or I don't prefer X simultaneously. Could just be a fact about people so like, I, I think there might be something any, any theory that denies that I, I think what could be going on here is something similar to in the last argument where there's like you know where the minor premise slips into like an assumption of moral realism or something so yeah it, it's important to bear in mind that even though the subjectivist is saying like well look it's true for frank um you know based off of what he believes about these moral claims then it makes it true for frank but he's not saying that there's like that there is um a moral fact in that that there's like a fact of the matter which is made true in virtue of frank's belief so if if the if the moral subjectivist theory was that there's a moral fact of the matter that's made true by frank's belief then maybe frank having contradictory beliefs would make it true that there's a true contradiction right but the the subjectivist isn't saying that they're just saying it's true relative to frank but uh, uh, based off of what he believes right and and so in this case it's like well yeah frank just has contradictory beliefs but that doesn't mean there's a true contradiction right um, it, you can almost think of it like they they there's like a, a there's a, there's a set of the claims which are just descriptions of the person's preferences and then the presumption here that cameron and i think other people are making is that the subjectivist is then trying to make this sort of claim about those claims and that that claim is true but that the claim sort of nested within it there's a contradiction and so that therefore the subjectivist is committed to a claim that holds true a contradiction can't do that so subjectivism is wrong but i'm not sure that subjectivism is actually making that extra claim that's nesting those other claims it's I, just i think saying, it's this premise a is going to be rejected because the subjectivist is just going to say i'm not saying well well no sorry that they're, they're going to reject premise seven that if moral subjectivism were true then there would be true contradictions because right, they saying, would reject premise seven yeah. They would just say, yeah, subjectivism doesn't commit me to saying that there are true contradictions. It would commit them to saying that it's true that people have contradictory beliefs or values or preferences or whatever. That's that's it. It's just committing them to that. It's not committing them to true contradictions. So, yeah, this is an easy one, I, I, like sort of technically looking at the premises and conclusion. Yeah, but if you just reject premise seven, it just doesn't they, follow from subjectivism that you think that there's true contradictions. There was you think it's true that, that people have contradictions. Or, or contradictory preferences. There was something someone said in the chat just with respect to um, linking it to the previous argument. So um, like, how can I have conflicting preferences if I'm infallible with regard to my preferences? So I guess the idea here is that you're infallible with res I mean, that we, as we said, you know, the subjectivist might not actually think this way, but but plausibly, right, the, the um, subjectivist might think that someone's f infallible with respect to their beliefs about what they believe, right, or something. But then they might just not, so so for any belief that they're kind of reflecting on at any one moment, then they're gonna be infallible. You know, like you ask them, well, do you believe X, right? They're gonna be able to reflect on that and produce for you some report. But what they might not have done is they might not have thought about the entailments of all of their beliefs together at the same time. And that's the kind of case that we are, are thinking about now. So you might say, 
you know, they might say, um, you, you could ask, do you believe X? And they would go, yes, I believe X. And then you go, well, do you believe if Y, then not X? And then they could go, yes. And then you go, well, do you believe Y? They'd say yes. And then you go, oh, you, so you can see now that there's kind of like this inconsistency in your belief because that commits you to not X and you've already said X. And then, but, but the point is that in, in providing us with any of these belief um, ascriptions, they're, they're like infallible in that like one instance it doesn't mean they're like infallible in the sense that they they've like figured out all the entailments at any given time yeah yeah i also wonder in some of these cases whether it's going to turn out to be an actual contradiction so if i'm ambivalent and i both have like want something and don't want something is that a contradiction i i'm not sure that it is uh, i'm not sure that i would like elevate my preferences or my attitudes to these sort of like atomic propositional claims that can just be neatly compared against one another. So I could both, I both have a preference to eat and a preference not to eat. And then I say, it is true that I want to eat. And it is true that I don't want to eat contradiction. Aha, like there's a problem with my views. I I'm not sure that that's what we should be doing when we're describing this psychology of ambivalence. Like are people contradicting themselves when they have mixed feelings? That seems a little weird. The Apostle Paul in Romans, what's it that he says? I do what I do not want, but I don't do what I think I should do. Something something along those lines, right? Um, does that mean Paul has a true contradiction? Yeah, so uh, I, don't know, I don't know. But, you know, part of the problem here might be that if we were really to give a more, uh, like a subtler and, and richer account of the kind of psychology that the subjectivist is attempting to capture, uh, that it might not be readily regimented by the kind of simplistic syllogistic logic that's being sort of that they're trying like you're trying to force it through the stricture that comes out looking like the person has contradictions in their beliefs but only because you're stripping away elements of the substantive content of the different preferences or attitudes or beliefs that the person has that would make it clear that the person might have a preference in one respect and a dispreference or preference against in some other respect and that they're not really contradicting one another in a meaningful way uh, and i don't see a problem with that so I'll play the last bit of this and then move on to the next video. So since there obviously can't be any true contradictions, it follows that moral subjectivism is not. And of course, you know, the person might actually just believe, well, actually, there are true contradictions as the upshot of their reflection about moral subjectivism. And it le I mean, we've, we've said why we don't think it does actually lead to um, true contradictions. But if they, you know, suppose they thought it did, maybe that would motivate them to think that there are some true contradictions. Just like it motivates some, you know, like just like the incarnation motivates some Christians to think there are true contradictions. Not true. All right, guys, that does it for this video. That's that one. Um, All right, I'm gonna take a quick break. I'll be right back in a minute. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I'll pop you. Yeah, you're on mute. Okay, so let me bring up the next video. Inspiring philosophy. This has been a long time since I watched um, the videos we're going to watch or video we're going to watch next. So about two or three years ago, um, yeah, IP did a series, uh, a nine part series on matter ethics. And he debated a few, he, he went around that year kind of debate, debating quite a few people actually on matter ethics. So this was the golden era of um, moral arguments. It was, it was actually a really good, um, really good time to be into um, apologetics. Okay. I'm back. Yeah, moral arguments still seem pretty popular. I feel like the debate scene, though, has a, it's sort of gone downhill since this kind of like golden, golden era period, you know, when you had like, this this was when like T-Jump was just starting out and he and IP had their debate and then there were a bunch of other like big debates. And I just don't seem to see people as in, interested anymore. Um, really? Uh, T-Jump just talked to Mike Humor just like a week ago. Oh, yeah. I know, I know he's having like conversations with people, but I mean, what I mean is in terms of like, the big like apologetics names having these debates mm, like, okay everyone was interested in whatever 
I, you know, I still see, see stuff from William Lane Craig, you know, I don't know, maybe we'll have another golden age. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Okay, so here's this one. Moral relativism is to view moral judgments are only true or false relative to a specific standpoint. This would mean something may be right in India, but wrong in America. Something may be right to you, but wrong to me. No standpoint is said to be privileged or better than any other. All views would be equally valid. Unlike non I don't know if you want to comment on that first claim, just the idea that privileged or seems it seems fine. The characterization seems fine so far. I'd want to explicitly draw a distinction between individual subjectivism and something like cultural relativism. Uh, but, you know, he, he made a reference to both and that seems good. Right. Or better than any other. All views would be equally valid. Unlike non-cognitivism, moral relativism accepts moral claims are true or false, but simply doesn't claim they would be objectively true or false. Truth is decided on different levels by different individuals or cultures or ethnic groups. In popular culture, this appears to have become a dominant view. We often hear people preface statements with, well, I personally believe this, or say things like, it feels right to me, and we all need to figure out what is true. So IP here using um, empirical investigation to prove moral relativism. <laughs> for each of us yeah a uh, quick comment on that i you know i don't know what year this came out but you know my whole thing is i do the empirical research on this and i find it puzzling that this like i seem to be the first person that's really started bringing this up in these discussions and it's like you know 2022 and this stuff has been around like some of the early studies were done back in 2003 2004 2008 so it's been around for a while and preceded this and somehow it still doesn't come up uh you know still hasn't come up i do want to flag one thing which is that uh I, IP in several of his discussions will insist realism is a sort of default or starting point and talk about realism being intuitive. Yet here he just said that relativism is like the, the most common view in popular culture. Those aren't incompatible. That could be like, it's like this popular view in like the sort of pop cultural zeitgeist, but it's still the case that most people are realists. Not inconsistent, but I do want to flag a tension there, which is that there seems to be a simultaneous recognition that a lot of people are relativists and sometimes the denial that a lot of people are relativists. And I, it's often unclear how people square those claims. Like in what sense, who are they talking about when they say most people are relative? Sorry, most people are realists. And then what they're talking about, like how they're quantifying the popularity of, of relativism. These are symptoms of a culture that has been founded on more relativistic views. The question I want to ask is if there's evidence and good reason moral relativism is true, or if there are problems with this line of thinking in metaethics. Moral relativism has been critiqued by several philosophers who have demonstrated it suffers from several problems. Let's begin by first looking at agent relativism. Remember, agent relativism says morality is defined by the individual. So each person will have moral views that are true to them, and every person's moral views would be equally right on the individual level. So this would mean all motivating reasons for morality would be internal, since they all come from the individual. Nothing external can motivate moral behavior, simply because morality is defined and created by the internal motives of each agent. So this would I'm just thinking about, does it have to be um, that motivation is internal? Because I'm thinking, like, it seems like the the truth makers are internal, right? Um, but someone could be motivated by external reasons. Or is this just a, a very particular view that IP is painting to respond to? It, it doesn't strike me as a huge problem. I don't know if he's trying to say that relativists are committed to internalism about motivation or not i think that that would i don't i wouldn't i wouldn't see that as like part of the definition of relativism that seems a little strange right if, if that's the claim being made that then i like have a bit of an issue but i'm not sure if that's what ip is saying or if i've just misunderstood or something yeah because here it's saying rel under agent relativism morality is defined by the motives of each agent but it's not necessarily saying something like you know if you have a subjective moral standard, then you will necessarily have some defeasible motivation to act in accordance with it. He's not saying that. So I don't think he's making that mistake. I think this is, he's just using language that gives the appearance of potentially overlapping with another area of metaethics. This would stand in contrast to something like moral realism, which says objective moral facts and duties exist externally to the agent, which motivate agents to act in a certain way. In moral realism, external reasons motivate agent relativism, only internal reasons can motivate, since there is no moral truth or standard outside of each agent, for those who hold there are only internal reasons and that there are no external reasons. However, 
If we can show external reasons can motivate, this would pose a problem for Asian relativism, and there seems to be arguments which we can use to show this. Consider an example. Perhaps there is a grumpy old man who automatically assumes his neighbors are mean and out to get him. However, one day a family moves in next door and is very nice to him. They bake him food and help him with his yard work and do everything they can to help him as their elder. After a while, the old man changes his attitude and is no longer grumpy, but is nice and kind to the family. The question we must ask is if the motivation to change his attitude was external or internal. Before the family moved in, could the old man have decided on his own to be nice to his neighbors? Arguably, this wasn't possible. When the family first approached him, he was angry and distant. So the challenge to agent relativism is that if we think the old man did have a reason to be nice, but there was no way for him to be motivated to change on his own, then we can infer he had a normative reason that was external to him. So the evidence would say there are... Ex sort of depends what... No way for him to, to be motivated to change on his own. <sighs> This is this is very strange. I've never seen any kind of objection like this before. So, so well, just I'm just not to even clarify. understanding what the objection is. This well, is I'll, I'll try to clarify. So he's saying that. Um, okay, so if agent relativism is true, right? Then, uh, then reasons internalism is true when it comes to motivation i think i think so i think he's he's saying that as like his first premise and then he's using this sort of as an intuition pump to say that reasons internalism is false because he's saying that there's this case right about this guy with the people next door and he couldn't possibly have changed his mind about them um based on internal reasons and so that this kind of intuition pump shows us that reasons externalism okay is true. but I mean, just as one point, reasons and motivations are not the same thing. And it looks like he's sliding between that terminology. And that is, a, that's a little confusing. I, those are just not the same things. Yeah, well, this is, so, this, that's what I was thinking um, previously when I, when I paused the video and said something, because I was, I was thinking it's, it's like he could have, he could have external reasons, but be motivated internally, right? And I was, I was kind of like, Get it, getting a bit confused, but the the um the agent relativist, right? I, I'm trying. I'm wondering if if it's true that the agent relativist has to be a reasons ha has to be has to be sorry, a, um yeah, like a reasons internalist as IP claims. I'm not sure if that is true in the first place. Um, yeah, I'm not sure either. So I, I do think it's interesting that he is pointing to agent relativism. So. Maybe that's something worth drawing attention to for whoever's you know listening to this. Is that there? And this isn't a common distinction that's made when describing different accounts of relativism. But there is a distinction between agent and appraiser relativism. And so, agent relativism uh, relativizes the moral standards to the values of the agent, sort of performing the action, the agent to whom the the normative considerations apply. Whereas appraiser uh, relativism relativizes the standards to whoever it is that's judging the particular scenario. So the agent relativist might say, you know, let's say Alex wants to steal something. Uh, and then Sam is judging what Alex should or shouldn't do. Um, if you're an agent relativist, you would say that whether uh, it's morally permissible for Sam to steal would depend on Sam's moral standards. But uh, from the appraiser point of view, it would, it would be whoever's judging. So if Alex says it's inconsistent with my standards, for Sam to steal, therefore it is wrong for Sam to steal, then that would come out as true be because you're relativizing the standards of the person judging the action, not the person committing the action. In principle, you could just think moral standards could be relativized to both. Then we can infer yet a normative reason that was external to him. A motivating mm -hmm. reason that's external to him. Maybe, but, but he could be motivated internally, but then finding out you know, like these new facts about the world changes what he well, does. There's a, there's a lot of weird things here, like the psychology of this. Can we go through these slide by slide? Okay. Yeah, that's what so I'm thinking. Let's uh, go back. If we show if we show that external reasons can motivate, this would pose a problem for Asian relativism. So external reasons are actually so, so he is using both the reasons and motivation language and the reasons, yes. the external reasons are supposed to cause the motivation. I think that's the idea. Yeah. Is that, is that, wow. Like the, 
yeah. external reasons are ca have causal efficacy. They cause things. How? That's that's wow. Okay, that's going to get metaphysically very strange. Uh, what are these external reasons that are causing things? How does that work? Well, I think I think yeah, that's it's very so weird. In the intuition pump, I suppose that's like the family, right? The family is an external reason, um, according to IP. But I guess you could say it's that's actually the not what an external reason is in the in the common parlance in meta ethics. So uh, anything is a reason that's not my own internal reasons. That's why I, I was going to say, even though the family, the family themselves are external, right? The person's reasons uh, and be beliefs and stuff associated with the family being there would be internal to the, to the agent. And so it would be internal reasons that I, I don't know. Okay. Let's look at the next part of this, which we can use to show this. Consider an example. Perhaps there is a grumpy old man who automatically assumes his neighbors are mean and out to get him. However, one day a family moves in next door and is very nice to him. Okay, so he so he assumed his neighbors were mean and out to get him. Then a family moves in next door and they are nice to him, right? But then isn't it going to be? This is what I'm thinking, and tell me if you think this is wrong. But I'm thinking then he could. It could be the case that he's formed the beliefs um, that the family aren't going to be that the people next door aren't going to be mean to him, and that motivates him to do whatever he's going to do differently. But that's that's an internal thing. That's not like. Right. So here's what it sounds like is going to happen. He has a belief that they, they're mean, and so he treats them one way. Then from their behavior, they indicate that they're not mean, and so he changes his beliefs and no longer believes that they're mean, and then he's nice to them. And so they're providing a sort of, he, is, he had a certain sort of uh, belief. The belief was mistaken. He updates or changes the belief to a different belief, and then his, his motivations and behavior follow suit in accordance with his beliefs. At what what's the external reasons here? This is very weird. I don't see well, how you get any kind of problem for relativism out of this. Let's see if it's going to be clearer. They make food and help him with his yard work and do everything they can to help him as their elder. After a while, the old man changes his attitude and is no longer grumpy, but is nice and kind to the family. The question we must ask is if the motivation to change his attitude was external or internal. Okay, there. The motivation to change his attitude? That's Yeah, this is like a different thing again, right? The motivation to change his attitude. The motivation to change his attitude. Does he need a motivation to change? Like his attitude could change for descriptive reason. Like he just, his beliefs yeah. change. Uh, yeah. What does that even mean? So this, this is the problem. This argument is just, seems to me to be too unclear to evaluate. I don't know what that means. Was the motivation to change his attitude external or internal? I don't know what he means by a, an external or an internal motivation. What does he mean by that? That it's like I, I think I think what IP is trying to say is that the family were external to to his mind or whatever, and they motivated him to change his attitude. But they causally interacted with him, which caused him to change his mental state. So, in what sense is yeah, it not yeah. internal? Yeah, it, it it sounds it sounds kind of strange to think that um, there's motivation taking place like outside of this guy's mind or something like. Uh, so we could imagine like another scenario, like let's say I, I say I hate um, I hate key lime pie and because every time I've tried it, it's been terrible. And someone goes, no, 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 you haven't tried a good key lime pie, and they make me one, and then I eat it, and then I like it. Is that an internal or? And then I go, oh, now I like key lime pie. Is that an internal or an external motivation to change my attitude towards key lime pie? What does it even mean to say? Because like there's an external impetus for me, like the person made the pie for me. But then once I eat the pie, it's I'm having different taste reactions that's internal. I don't know. I don't I don't understand what this is trying to get at. It's it's I don't know. Before the family moved in, could the old man have decided on his own to be nice to his neighbors? Yeah. Yes, yeah. probably. Could he? Yeah, like, could he? Yes. But then the the other question is, like, would he? Which would be no, probably. And, and you've got to be careful because could and would are very different there. Um, yeah. So so I think IP is kind of, like, maybe what IP is driving at, right, is he wants the answer to be no, he couldn't, right, have changed his mind on his own. 
And so therefore, the only thing that changes in the two cases is the external thing. And that establishes that that's an external reason or something. Right. But go back to my key lime pie example. So I've had a hundred, I've tried a hundred key lime pies. They've all been disgusting. So I, I conclude key lime pies, you know, just standard inductive inference. Key lime pie is terrible. I, and what I mean by that is like a subjective claim. Again, we're going to go with me being an agent relativist. I shouldn't eat key lime pie because it's gross and you shouldn't eat things that are gross, all else being equal, something like that, right? So I'm a subjectivist about food. I think key lime pie is gross. Then a family moves in next door. I tell them I hate key lime pie and it's a specialty of theirs. They make it. I love it. I change my attitude about it. Now we could ask the question, could I have changed my attitude yeah, about yeah. whether key lime pie is disgusting before I tried a good one? Maybe not. It might just be a feature of the way that my brain works and it's not a feature I'm opposed to that if I've, that my inductive inferences like work well, so far I have very good evidence that key lime pie is something that I just don't like. It's it's inconsistent with my subjective preferences. I haven't had good evidence. So, and it might be that my judgments about, my beliefs about which things are consistent or inconsistent with my preferences are, are they don't just change arbitrarily. Like I, I don't have, I'm not like a doxastic voluntarist that thinks you could just willy nilly choose to believe whatever. Like I could just choose to prefer different foods. I could just choose to prefer different music. I don't think I actually have the capacity to do that. Um, so we could say, no, I couldn't change my attitude about key lime pie until someone gives me a good one, until I get new evidence. Does that mean that subjectivism about food preferences is false? I don't see how it shows that. And it's just the same thing for, you just apply the same reasoning to moral standards. So yeah, arguably this wasn't possible. Right, this but so, possible. I, so what I'm saying here is that even if this wasn't possible in this case, I don't think this is yeah. a good argument against relativism. Yeah, because you're, you're saying it would still be the, inter like as you taste the, the new key lime pie or whatever, your beliefs change, and then internally you're motivated to like, report different things about what you think about key lime pie or something. Yeah. Right. So this argument requires us to make an assumption that is contestable. So someone might just say, yeah, you could change your mind in advance. I don't think you could. I think it's fine to just say, yeah, you can't change your mind. But some, uh, it, it's like a totally legitimate for someone to say, yeah, maybe maybe you could change your mind. So that's one move. I wouldn't make the move. I would just accept that you can't. And then just say, yeah, wasn't possible. In no way is this a problem for relativism. When the family first approached him, he was angry and distant. So the challenge to agent relativism is that if we think the old man did have a reason to be nice, but there was no way for him to be motivated to change on his own, then we can infer he had a normative reason that was external to him. So the evidence would say there are external reasons, and thus show there are external normative factors. As Ruth Schaefer Landau says, It is true of many different kinds of people that if they were somehow to look beyond the picture of things they have grown used to, they would find themselves with an outlook, a plan of life, and a set of circumstances that they would find more valuable than they could ever have imagined. In such cases, realizing the relevant benefits often requires a change of character. The goodness available only to those who make such changes may be so valuable as to make it true that one has, despite one's present motivations, a reason to make necessary changes. So if we can be ext Do you want to pause that? Yes. Okay. So here's what here's one of the things that I think is going on, and I think this is a problem that Parfit makes. It looks like uh, Schaefer Landau makes it. Other people might make it too. Sometimes I think that the realists think uh, that they can slip in this idea of external reasons uh, by conflating what a person has epistemic access to versus whether or not their reasons are like genuinely external to them. And so you know they might say something like, if someone gives me a drink and I think it's a glass of water and it's actually poison that uh, I have a reason not to drink the water. Uh, and then if I do drink the wa water, which is poisoned and I die, then, you know, I made a mistake uh, and I had a reason to not drink the water. And the reason is external to me. No, no, it's not. Uh, what's actually going on there is it's just, I have, a, you could just say I have a stance dependent or an internal reason, which is that it's inconsistent with my goal to not die, to drink the poison. I just lack epistemic access to the non-moral facts, or the, in this case, the non-prudential facts about the impact that the action would have on me. And so it's not that I have an, I don't have an external reason in the sense that I have a re so because an external reason, what Parfit and other realists want out of external reasons, and this would be analogous to, and this would like apply to this case, is that the person has a reason to do the thing independent of their own goal standards or values, not independent of their own beliefs right, or what they're yes, currently yeah. in a position to know. And they're just mixing those two up. What I find incredible is that 
professional philosophers are mixing these two up. How are they mixing these two up? They shouldn't mix these two up. Uh, so in this case, let's take this old man here. So this old man, if you sat down to this guy and talked to him before the family moved in, you might say something like this. I have the following set of values. I want to treat neighbors that are friendly to me well, and I want to treat neighbors that are unfriendly to me yeah, right. poorly. So it's going to be dependent on his values, his own rules right? and values. Yeah. And yeah. he, when they move in, he goes, I think that they're jerks, so I'm going to treat them poorly. Then he learns out, oh, I was mistaken about that. I actually had a reason to treat them nicely. But what is the reason? Well, the reason is that they are nice and he wants to treat nice families well. And so it's, again, dependent on his values. He didn't have an external reason. He just had an unknown reason that was internal. He just wasn't aware of it. And so the idea here is that internal is there's an, is an equivocation, uh, there's an equivocation between what the person knows and what would or wouldn't be consistent with the person's values. So fact the, 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 I guess you could say the internalist about re reasons, the person that's favoring some sort of stance dependent account of reasons would say that whether you have a reason to do something or not depends on what would be consistent with, with which, what would be conducive to your ends. And you have a reason not to do things that would be inconsistent with your ends. You don't have to be aware of the non-moral facts, uh, right. you know, for those reasons, for you to like have those reasons, so to speak. So there just seems to be a mistake here. Like there's just mixing up epistemic considerations and I guess meta-ethical considerations. Hmm. Internally motivated by normative reasons, then that would mean agent relativism is incorrect and morality is not defined by the individual. Agent relativism also makes morality quite ad hoc. If moral facts depend... So just, just I think, I don't know that we're going to get that much more about that particular argument, but just to say, I mean, maybe IP... I, I'm not sure that even if IP did establish that there are these... Um, external normative reasons that it would undermine well maybe it would undermine agent relativism if they were normative right um if, if there are ex just external reasons then um i don't know maybe a reason is normative essentially normative um i don't i, I guess yeah I, just, I, I th yeah no go ahead go ahead I, I i was just thinking that um I wasn't sure about that initial claim about agent relativism and its relationship to internal or external reasons, but maybe, maybe I should be, you know, leaning at least towards the um, external reasons would undermine agent relativism in some sense. Um, I don't know. Well, yeah, I would think I would think that a relativist is going to deny that there are external reasons. I mean, that's when you endorse an anti-realist position. Part of what you're doing typically is rejecting yeah. the notion. There's that nothing there like that. that could, yeah, right. They're, you're going to reject that there are like stance-independent moral facts. And often, if you ask someone to explain what a stance-independent moral fact is, they might say something like, "It's it's the kind of moral fact that provides you with external or like perfect might say something like a decisive reason, reasons to do things that the reasons are independent." of your goal standards or values. So there are these, these sorts of facts that provide reasons. And that's the language I'll sometimes use is they'll provide or they'll furnish you or they'll give you reasons to do things. And, and that's those the normativeness, reasons, right? Is that in, in, yeah, it, that's in some the sense they make you do, reasons. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and to, you know, this is something that I think most relativists would do because this is kind of not a common position that people within the field of meta-ethics take. But my reaction to that is to just say that I don't even think that's intelligible. Uh, you know, if someone says you have reasons to do things, so I could talk about like what serves my interest. I could tell you this would be good or bad for my health. This yeah. would be good or bad. They're for appealing to goals. things you believe in stuff, right? Because it could, right, yeah. yeah. I, I'm always going to be referring to something like that exists, like psychological facts about myself. But if I'm told that I have reasons to do things, and the reasons are in no way connected to my goals or interests. I don't know what to do with that. Like, okay, so I have a reason. I have a reason to do a thing, but it has nothing just to do with my I goals. Do, you just say I don't have a reason to do it, right? <laughs> like, That's if it I, doesn't align, I, it, yeah. I don't know what it means to say that I have a reason mm. to do things. That like I have an external reason. I literally. So I, I, I don't know if I'd say I don't know. I, I don't think I have those reasons. So much as I would start out by just saying, well, what would it mean for me to have them? And in every case that I've had these discussions, I've never had a satisfactory explanation. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't an explanation, and it doesn't mean that there couldn't be such reasons. Uh, I suspect that there aren't, and that people saying this are kind of, they're kind of just caught up in this linguistic trap where it's almost like someone running around saying, you know, there's there's uh, colorless colors or something like that. 
Yeah, uh, I see what you said. I can't make sense of it. Uh, that, again, it doesn't mean it can't be made sense of, but that puts me at in an unusual dialectical position when discussing these issues because there's a certain element of the discourse that I suspect is literally meaningless. And it's difficult to engage with arguments that start dropping in terminology where I suspect, first of all, it's not explained here. Uh, and that's not necessarily the problem. A video like this doesn't have to explain everything. But second, I don't think there's an explanation on offer anywhere, even in any print publication anywhere. Just, these ideas are supposed to be primitive. They can't be explained. So I don't know what to do with that. So here, so this um, comment in the, I can't click on it. Um, so, so imagine, you know, someone says, I have external reasons to treat hydrogen as having one proton. And I suppose here, implicit in the epistemology is some idea that hydrogen is having one pro proton, um, sort of like causally interacts with you and impinges on your senses, whatever, and causes you to have that belief, giving you like a reason to believe it or something. Um, d d is that like a kind of counter example to what you're saying about there can't be external reasons and why no, not? No, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that the fact that something is true gives me an, ex an external reason to believe it. <laughs> whether I want it, whether I believe it or not, is going to depend on my own goals and values. I value what's true for the most part, but I don't think it's true of an agent that they must care about what's true or that they must conform their epistemic practices towards truth optimization. So yeah, I don't even think this is a case of that. So I have external reasons to treat hydrogen as having one proton. Yeah, I would say that that I, it's probably unintelligible. It, it, yeah, it, st it still seems like it, even in that example, it depends quite heavily upon what you believe about this kind of like um, appearance or whatever that you're having. Or I mean, obviously, like hydrogen and it, the number of protons that it has doesn't like directly impinge on your senses or something. So presumably there's some experiment or something that, you know, is is giving you this reading somehow um, or giving you numbers that calculate to to, to figure that out. But well, it um, might be that if the fact that hydrogen has has one proton can cause various sorts of experiences and certain sorts of descriptive facts, uh, but it's not going to cause me to have a reason. I don't, well, I mean, maybe, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't know what that would mean. And I don't know what that would add to our account of describing hydrogen as having one proton. I think we could get the job done just thoroughly with descriptive facts and we don't need to appeal to any type of normativity to, to make sense of hydrogen having one proton. So what I'm not denying is that there are stance independent descriptive facts. I'm denying that there are stance independent normative facts. Uh, and, and more generally that anything is irreducibly normative. I, I suppose my thinking here is that it's very difficult to make sense of um, supposing that that's true in reality, right? Um, out, out in the external world. It's very, it's very difficult to make sense of that somehow um, providing you... So, I, I'm kind of getting close to talking about reasons and causes as being the same, but that, that like causing you and somehow to like have this this thing which makes you want to change your mind about it when you didn't think it before without making an appeal to like things that you believe, right? Um, it's very difficult for me to kind of like paint paint a picture of that happening without appealing to like certain beliefs that you have about the way reality is or what's going on there. or And then that seems to make it essentially like subjective, right? Because wh whenever I'm... I'm thinking of what's going on there. I'm going to appeal to like what Lance thinks about his various appearances and so on. Right. But, you know, I think that people have a tendency to conflate whether or not it, I have a reason to do something is, is, is best construed in subjectivist or non-subjectivist terms and whether it's true, the, the thing in question. Those are just different things. So it could just not be in my interests to believe something that's true. So, you know, this comes up a lot with, you know, accounts of epistemic realism where it's, it's supposed to be like, you know, if if you're presented with valid with a valid argument with true premises, then you ought to accept the conclusion. I would just say that the conclusion follows. The conclusion is true if those if the premises are true and it's a valid argument. I don't know why we need to add the ought there. Why ought I? What if it wouldn't serve my interests? Why Why ought I? I, do I do I have to believe what's true independent of whether it's my goal? What if you didn't know the inference rules, right? Like, what if you didn't believe the if you believed a different set of inference rules? Um, well, it, you know, it, it's just the case that it just might not be consistent with my interest to always adopt epistemic practices that optimize for for true beliefs. I don't think that's the only goal or interest we have. I see the acquisition of truth as instrumental someone could value the truth for its own sake but you're you're never going to get stance independence out of that you're just it's stance dependence at best all the way down if 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 we're not just going to go with what i go with which is some sort of 
quietist view that just sort of dissolves the whole discourse. Okay, I'll uh, depend on the individual. Then what does it stop me from changing my moral views tomorrow, depending on what side of the bed I woke up on? If right and wrong is simply dependent on me, then it becomes very arbitrary, and I can simply define morality by what is pleasurable or useful to me, not in any type of internal truth. And I can change this on a whim's notice if I feel like it. In reality, what else would motivate our internal moral truth anyway? Yet, we do not act as if morality can simply be so arbitrary, or should depend on such personal things. Do you want to respond to the idea that because moral subjectivists, moral subjectivists could just kind of change their mind about what they want to be true or false? Uh, yes. So this is one of this is one of the issues that actually does tick me off. Like it really bothers me about uh, the way that people frame subjectivism. So the idea here is is well, here's one reason to be worried about subjectivism is that the subjectivists can just change their moral values on a whim. They could just wake up in the morning and decide it's okay to murder and steal and and, and torture people. And so it, morality is is in a certain sense like it's like whimsical, it's arbitrary, it's potentially chaotic and frenetic. A person could just wake up tomorrow and do whatever. You never know with a subjectivist. It 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 depicts subjectivists like they're. I don't even know. They're not even. They're not even necessarily like a, a psychopath or an, an evil person. They're a person who just acts on whatever whim strikes their fancy. But this, I mean, first of all, that has nothing to do with whether subjectivism would be true or false, or like a good account of the, what what people are doing with moral language or any of that. Uh, but second, it it seems to be setting up this this implied opposition where the realist has these wonderfully stable moral standards and the subjectivist doesn't. Two things. First, the subjectivists, simply because they could change them on a whim, doesn't mean that we should be overly concerned about that. I can't change my food preferences on a whim. I can't change my music preferences on a whim. Right. My values, uh, you know, a subjectivist can be equally, not any less, any they, they could be equally as committed to their moral values as any moral realist. They could be just as, as motivated to act in accordance with their moral values, just as, as rigid and conforming to them, just as stable in their, their moral beliefs. And their moral values and their moral standards and their moral preferences they can be very uh, um very stable now flip this over on the reverse side the realist is supposed to have these really stable solid moral standards but actually their moral standards can vary in accordance not with their preferences but with whatever they happen to believe the objective moral facts are so they could wake up tomorrow and think that it, they have an objective moral duty to torture or steal or kill and then they might do it regardless of what their preferences are so Two things to say about that. One is if the objectivist it, it, like necessarily acts only in accordance with their subjective moral standards, and so they, oh, we don't have to worry about them acting in accordance with false subjective beliefs about what's objectively right or wrong. They're not going to torture, steal, and kill because that's inconsistent with their preferences. Okay, now you've got the objectivist is going to have a really weird problem, which is that if people only ever act only in accordance with their subjective values, what so objectivism has this sort of trivial, it's like trivial. People can't comply with whatever the objective moral facts are. They only act in accordance with their subjective moral facts. Now, if the objectivist can and potentially would act in accordance with whatever the objective moral facts are independent of whether that's consistent with their goals or values or preferences or whatever, now the objectivist is subject to a sort of parallel instability, potentially, which is that so long as they're, they're convinced that they have an objective moral duty or it's objectively morally permissible to do something that we think would be terrible, they could and they potentially would do it. And that's not something that's available to the subjectivist because the subjectivist would say, I don't care what the objective moral facts are. They're not consistent with my preferences. Or they might just say, I don't think there are any. Uh, but it, you know, we have, to, we have to consider both at the motivational level what the subjectivist um, would do in response to objective moral facts, were there any, and what they would do in response to uh, like the objectivism as as a position that they could potentially reject. So you have this you have this issue here where it's it, the framing is like subjectivists are these people that will just do whatever and uh, realists aren't. I just don't like. I mean, first of all, that's contingent on certain psychological facts about how the agents in question have to be happen to be whether it's humans or some other organism or whatever. Uh, and I don't know what the facts are. Maybe people like uh, what's more stable: people's moral preferences or people's moral beliefs if they're a realist. I don't know. That's an empirical question. So it could be that realists in practice are actually less stable in their moral standards than the subjectivists, or it could be subjectivists are less stable. Those are empirical questions. We don't get to just act like we just know subjectivists are these whimsical people that might wake up and start, start killing people, but realists aren't. And, you know, 
if someone's going to make the claim that most people are realists, we can look at all these instances in history where people committed horrible atrocities on the assumption that they were act complying with objective moral facts, potentially. I don't. I think a lot of realists would think those people are themselves realists. So why were those people doing all these terrible things? So the idea here is that realism somehow insulates people from atrocities. I see no reason to think that that's the case. Something that's interesting is when you when you think about those cases that you mentioned, like your food preferences that we would all agree to is that those being subjective or maybe like your favorite color or something. I mean, it sort of seems to me that those things are relatively stable. I mean, obviously, they kind of change over time. But yeah, it just isn't clear to me that you get um, this kind of this kind of radical change in people's beliefs about um, or, or, or people's kind of preferences around food choice or what color that they report as being their favorite color as um, IP is kind of making out here, you know, would be the case for any kind of subjectivist theory of phenomena of phenomena X. So yeah, it just, it just doesn't seem right. I mean, um, I'm sure there's all sorts of things that influence the kind of beliefs that people have and um, you know, why, why they have those beliefs and so forth, whether it, whether subjective morality is true, or whether we're talking about food preferences or whatever. But I mean, it's, it's just strange to think that they're just going to be completely arbitrary. Um, okay, I'll play it a bit. I think Lance is just about back. So then... Oh, yeah. One last thing to say about that, um, which is a quicker one, which is simply that it might also be the case that people can't change their moral values on a whim. So the presumption here yeah, seems to yeah. be that if you're... Even if, if there were a moral fact, yeah. Like, I can't just choose to think murdering people for fun is morally okay. I, I literally don't think I can do that. Like, if I tried to. Also, why would I want to? So I, you have this other motivational issue. If I have a certain set of moral standards, I, I guess the idea might be that, ooh, I really want my moral standards to line up with my selfish interests or something like that. Uh, can, can, are people capable of doing that? I, I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, but to the extent that people are, are able to conform their moral standards to their selfish preferences, are we, are we going to just ignore the fact that people could probably rationalize or engage in motivated reasoning to convince themselves that they have objective moral duties that happen to conform with their preferences or, or goals or interests? It, it seems people are at least as capable of doing that. And we understand there are external normative reasons that can motivate us or affect our moral views. So this would most likely infer something like cultural relativism or moral realism is true. And morality is defined by something external to the individual. Speaker relativism has its own issues. If you remember, speaker relativism is different from agent relativism in that agent relativism focuses on the one performing the action. Speaker relativism cares about the one making the claim. In other words, the agent relativist focuses on the person's actions as the moral agent. A speaker relativist focuses on the moral framework as the speaker who is speaking about another agent's actions. So when I make a moral claim, I'm referring to my moral framework. When you make a moral claim, you're referring to your moral framework. Yet this creates a problem. If I were to say abortion is okay and you said abortion is wrong, then under speaker relativism, there seems to be no shared meaning. This agreement depends on shared meaning. So for example, if I say a plane flies through the air and you say no it doesn't, but we find out you mean a carpenter's tool, we realize there is no disagreement because there is no shared meaning. If speaker relativism is true, we cannot ever disagree because we never have shared meaning. What is right for you is not right for me. As Ragnar Francine says, the problem for moral speaker relativism is that it makes moral assertions made by speakers with different morality be about different things, express different propositions, and that they therefore do not disagree in the intuitive sense when they are involved in moral disputes. Speaker relativists try to avoid this by attempting to divorce the truth conditions of a sentence with the meaning of a sentence. In other words, the meaning of a sentence doesn't determine the conditions under which it is true. But this seems incorrect, as David Lewis noted. A meaning for a sentence is something that determines the concessions under which the sentence is true or false. If That's just a reassertment, <laughs> reassaying the, the claim that it's supposed to establish. Um, well, a famous person said it, so it's correct. Yeah, I. So, so this, this, this is, is similar to what the one of the arguments that Cameron put forward, but it's slightly slightly different, I suppose. Um, and it's just it's just going to depend on what ha how the subjectivist understands what's actually taking place in the disagreement, right? And whether it is this dispute about um, meanings, or whether or or even I mean, you could even take a different view of what meaning is if you look at meaning as being like successful use of the language, right, in a linguistic practice. Well, 
then you you can use terms like good and bad just to try and achieve certain goals and it doesn't matter about what kind of thing appears before someone's mind as they use those words yeah so a few things one is i think that there i i just want to flag a sort of meta point which is that apologists do this thing I, I see quite frequently, and you have much more experience at this, where it seems like they like to draw on esteemed and high status figures, and they'll just quote them, and then they'll just quote them agreeing with whatever the apologist wants to say. They, they won't present a, a good argument, they won't present evidence, they'll just reassert what the apologist wants to say. And then that's treated as evidence, like, look, this famous person said it. But like anyone could cherry pick quotes from people that agree with them, that are prominent and high status to support an argument. I think I think that there's something inappropriate about doing that. It it, it lends, I think, artificial credence to a claim to draw on, on people like that. The other thing I, I wanted to point out that I didn't point out before about this analysis of disagreement is the presumption is, is you know, the, the person critiquing the relativist will say, well, if people were doing this and people would be talking past one another and that wouldn't make any sense. And, and oh, I see, people, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Do you not think Isn't people, what's are going on? Talking, yeah. people are constantly talking past one another? I, I mean, there are many, many cases where I see people disagreeing or having a dispute or having a discussion where they are not having the same discussion. So, I mean, part of the assumption here seems to be that when people are communicating that they're always on the same page, that's absurd. Like if, if a philosopher wants to bet money on it, that if we actually go do an analysis of actual everyday moral discussions and non-moral discussions that we will find just a, 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 a absurd amount of instances of people talking past one another and failing to communicate adequately i'll put the i'll put the money up on that i, I mean that's of course people do that all the time and again I, i'm making an empirical claim maybe i'm wrong but it's just it's weird to assume that people are like super duper successful at being on the same page when they're talking to one another maybe they're just not it is true but this seems incorrect under which this lay a hidden message that the enemies are about to attack, the meaning will determine whether or not it is true. We cannot simply divorce truth conditions from meaning. Therefore, if there has to be shared meaning as speaker relativists have to acknowledge, then this creates a problem, as Andrew Fisher says. If the speaker relativist claims that where people have different moral frameworks, there can be a common meaning, and if meaning determines the truth conditions, then it seems that the speaker relativist is committed to there being common truth conditions across cases of different moral frameworks. But then, of course, it is a mystery why their position should be called relativism. If truth and meaning are not relative to individual moral frameworks, what is left for them to be relative about? Yeah, but then wouldn't, couldn't you just say truth, truth and meaning are relative to individual moral frameworks when it comes to terms like um, good, you know, like abortion is good or something like that, right? So the two people don't disagree about what abortion is. Um, what they disagree about is whether it's good or not. And so in that case, um, you just have two people who d disagree about what they mean by good and bad, and they disagree by what they what they think is true. Um, I, I don't really see how this argument is going to be accepted by someone who's just consistently holds to the subjectivist theory. I mean, maybe that's the point, though. Maybe they're saying that's just too much of a bullet to bite, and because this is so obvious. Um, so maybe I'm just thinking about it the wrong way. And, and yeah, I mean, these these objections shouldn't be taken to entail that well, they're they must be wrong, but rather that if they want to consistently hold to their position, they're going to have to bite various kinds of bullets. I mean, it could be Th this particular passage. I wouldn't know what to do with this unless I read it in context. So I don't have much to say about that either. Yeah, fair enough. Perhaps we have shared meaning under cultural relativism. Perhaps the problem with both agent relativists and speaker relativists is they do not realize they get their moral framework from larger cultures that determine truth conditions and meaning in moral frameworks, as well as explain why there are external normative reasons that motivate us. Remember that cultural relativism teaches that morality is defined by the culture. Individuals get their moral views from a larger culture, which defines the moral framework for individuals in these cultures. And perhaps this is correct, as it appears morality does differ from culture to culture. In the West, we prize equal rights for men and women, whereas in parts of Africa, women are often treated as second-class citizens. In traditional Christian cultures, abortion is perceived to be wrong, whereas in more secular cultures, abortion is perceived as neither good or bad. So perhaps morality is defined by the culture. Well, the problem with this line of thinking is, as we have already noted in our defense of moral realism, cultural disagreements do not necessarily mean morality is subjective for the same reason different beliefs about the age of the earth does not mean science is subjective. There is a real world out there we can discover, and certain humans are only in error when they miscalculate the age of the Earth. 
moral facts and duties may be objectively true, and cultural differences may just mean certain cultures are better at understanding objective moral facts and duties, whereas some are simply incorrect in their moral assessments of the facts. It's like it may mean that, right? But it's the point is to compare the hypotheses and and say, you know, it's not it's not just going to be good enough to have like this bare possibility because the idea here is that both theories are consistent with, um, you know, the the observed phenomena, right? Which is that different cultures report different um, moral claims. Better at understanding objective moral facts and duties, whereas some are simply incorrect in their moral assessments of the facts. Second, cultures tend to have wide agreement on values and duties, and the actual differences seem to lie in underlying factual misconceptions. If one tribe thinks it is okay to kill members of a neighboring tribe, it usually is from an underlying factual belief about the humanity of the other tribe, like that the other tribe is not fully human, that they are really demons or monsters. I sort of think citation needed here, you know. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Like the British, for example, thought that Indians. I mean, there were lots of racists around, but they didn't think there were demons or anything. Um, it just a little bit strange. Um, I, I have no idea myself, like how many of the cultures that engage in warfare actually do think that, you know, the people that they're fighting against are not humans. Yeah, these are just going to be empirical questions uh, that, yeah. If you could convince the first tribe, the other tribe is just as human as they are. They tend yeah. to change. The like, like the he's putting the World War the world war one thing is up it's like they didn't think that germans weren't humans i mean obviously they dehumanized them in various ways but like i'm pretty sure no one would have said yeah like they've stopped being human now or something um it's a bit ambiguous what it means to not be a human uh like not deserving of like like human right, in some exactly. existential yeah. way or not human like biologically like what does that even mean um I'm well, maybe it's curious. used, right? Maybe human is used to confer certain moral kind of like rights and things, right? So, right, that's so not going to get you. Autologous. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's not going to get you anywhere. Uh, but this is also probably the sort of thing that's going to be it, going to be very dependent on variable empirical details that are hard to work out and that I don't know and realists don't know and that none of us are, are like, we would all have to go look at the empirical literature on on these sorts of questions. And I just don't know what that, that's not my area of specialization. I don't know what it says. There are monsters. Should be killed off or not? Moral differences between cultures tend to be based on factual errors, not actual value differences. See my video on moral realism for a better explanation of moral convergence. So the existence of different cultural views on morality doesn't actually count as evidence for moral relativism. Plus, cultures are he says it doesn't count as evidence for moral relativism because he's rendered um, the phenomena consistent with um, realism, but he's not actually done any likelihood comparison as to which of the views renders it, you know, yeah. it's more expected under. And so he's not actually comparing the hypotheses. It could still right, be so, evident. In favor yeah, if realism were true, would we expect more or less moral agreement? I, I, I don't know. I mean, you would have to consider all of like, what type of realism are we talking about? Uh, you know, it, it might not be surprising that people disagreed under certain circumstances, and it might be surprising if they continue to disagree under other circumstances. And it's just going to come down to what those circumstances are, what type of realism we're dealing with. It's going to come down to a lot of different considerations. So, I, I mean, I, to be fair, this is intended to be, because it looks like the video is just 14 minutes. This is not an in-depth analysis of all of that. So I don't want to hold an argument that's intended to summarize a particular issue to a standard that it couldn't possibly accommodate in the time allotted right, right. to do so. So I'm not going to try to hold it to that standard. So maybe there would be a bunch of empirical evidence for particular claims that could be presented and just maybe they're in the footnotes. I don't know. So it, it's good at a certain point when someone making claims about meta ethics is making empirical claims about human society, human psychology, and human history, and human anthropology, and all these sorts of things to say, hey, citation needed for that particular claim. But they, they they could be somewhere, like, I don't know, just because they're not presented in a three-minute segment of a video doesn't mean they're not there. They're typically hard to define. Where are the governing lines that separate cultures? And when do they apply? What if a Muslim family from China moves to America? What cultural morality should they be subject to? Their family, their origin, or the current culture they live in? Where exactly are the lines dividing cultural morality? At the regional level? National the thing about these is that they're questions, right? But it's not that the cultural relativist doesn't 
have anything to say in response to these questions if you were to actually ask them i mean i as as he's going through i'm running in my head like yeah like here's maybe how a cultural relativist would think about that like the family that's been in two cultures maybe they have some kind of amalgam right and they're kind of conflicted between the different values that they've adopted from from either culture and so forth and, Right. And we, could also, <laughs> we also have to worry about the constant, and this seems to be a recurring theme here of like smuggling realism in through the back door, which is that, you know, if, if a person moves from one culture to another culture, you could then say, well, what are they supposed to do? They're kind yeah, of right. in one culture and kind of in another, but it's like, well, hold on. This isn't a problem for a cultural relativist who says, well, relative to one culture, they should act one way, relative to another culture, they should act a different way. Uh, yeah, if you're asking what should they do, right? <laughs> and then the question is, though, from their point of view, what what do they think they should do, right? And they might have some conflicted accounts. So there's these different questions that can get mixed up. Sure. But, you know, the idea here, I, I do think that this kicks up enough dust for the relativist to owe a decent explanation because people aren't neatly categorizable into this community or that community or this group or that group. People can be part of multiple groups and they could be within a sub-community, within a community that's another community that it, that split off from another community recently, and now their values are in a process of, of change from the other community, but then they live in a nation, and then that nation is part of like a, a federation of nations, and that that has a, a, like a, you know, there's Geneva Conventions, or so like, which standards are they subject to? It looks like they're, it's like there's this whole nested standards within standards within standards that they are potentially subject to, and then like, what if they go to work, and the work place has a particular code of conduct that conflicts from a, you know, like, so there are these difficult questions of what all the standards are being relativized to. And it could get really wild that a particular person in this, in a particular circumstance, we could say that relative to their subjective preferences, this is what's right or wrong relative to the standards in their workplace. This is what's right or wrong. Um, and then relative to all these other things, there would be a fact of the matter about what's right, like consistent or inconsistent with those different standards. And then you could ask the question, like, what should, if that person asked the question, what should I do? That is a tough question. So I, I think relativists could just concede that if they're, if they're interested in providing action guidance, like practical action guidance to individuals, it could get pretty tricky. But, see, but you know, right. that doesn't mean it's impossible. I, yeah, it's it, a lot's going to hinge on like what's meant by a culture here and how, how are they exactly constructing that thing and drawing the boundaries and stuff. But I, and I agree with you that um, that phrase you use, there's enough dust kicked up to kind of that they kind of owe an explanation. But I think what I'm getting at is it, it doesn't seem at all implausible to me that anyone who is committed to cultural relativism isn't going to have something like in principle to say to kind of each of these questions. Right. So so just raising the questions isn't enough for me to just be like, yeah, that view is kind of done away with or something. National village family. Where exactly does a cultural set of moral values begin and end? What if a man from culture A has sex with a woman from culture B in a country where culture C is present? By what cultural morality are they judged by? If you say there are some kind of external rules which govern these cultural divides and decide what different cultural moral views apply, how is that not setting an objective standard we must abide by beyond the cultural norms? If truth and meaning are not relative to cultural moral frameworks, what is left for them to be relative about? Objective laws which govern and divide morality into different cultures is a form of moral realism where values and facts are decided, not on what the culture sets, but on governing principles, not decided by humans. It's like if, if truth and meaning are not defined by, like again, that doesn't seem that bizarre of a thing for someone to think, at least from my perspective, that truth and meaning are culturally relative as well. Um, I think I think maybe this this philosopher's kind of idea of propositions, you know, like, like what sentences um, express propositions, but really, you know, the the um, German person who says, you know, like, um, Schnee ist Weiss or whatever, and the English person who says snow is white, they actually mean the same thing. But then, you know, anyone who is at, who who's really is bilingual and speaks two different languages and engages in any translation works, no, it, 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 it just doesn't work like that, you know? Like, you, you, as you learn Spanish for the first time, you're taught, like, to say adios um, when you say goodbye, but that means to God, right? And you don't say to God in English. Um, and they like do they both express the proposition goodbye but what you know why do you say it, that it expresses the proposition goodbye in english i mean if you're a spanish speaker does it, does it express the proposition to god or is it just something that's used by people in a context is the meaning you know culturally relevant uh, relative um yeah yeah this is making me think though that th there is there would be a concern of the relativist just trying to offer a sort of semantic account of what 
the person themselves what standard they are attempting to refer to when they say right yeah like are yeah, they yeah, yeah. like okay let's say you're a culture relativist and then yeah the theory is correct relative to my culture or something is that what you're thinking or yeah so and so alex means murder is inconsistent with the standards of my culture what is alex what does that mean so like if you ask alex like what what is your what is your culture is alex going to have like a good response like did like only people in like the contiguous united like the states or or, or only people like what about uh, people because then you could say ah okay but what about people that are are currently in the united states but they're on vacation and they're from another culture does are those standards included and then they might say oh no i didn't think about that then they're not uh, what about people that have radically divergent standards like they live out in the woods and they they have totally different standards okay no 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 not them what about people that live in more insular communities that don't share the standards of the culture of the society that they're in so like the amish community oh no no, no i don't mean those so then there's like all these lacuna and all these exceptions so and that they didn't think about and so now what are they referring to exactly it's going to get really weird very quickly for them to specify what they would be referring to um it, maybe it's just strange to say that the person is making a simplistic claim like I am referring to people living within the United States. But it, it seems to be even stranger to say that they're making this like hyper, super, mega, ultra sophisticated claim where they're like, right. I need people in the United States that are like don't meet these like 70,000 exclusion criteria, you know, for being in this or that sub community. Oh, so I don't mean people that, um, I don't know, or I don't mean psychopaths. I don't mean these people. I don't mean, like they could just make all these exceptions. And all the exceptions would make sense, right? So you, you probably wouldn't want to include people that literally don't have moral beliefs in the same way that other people do, due to whatever neurological thing. So there there would be a whole bunch of considerations. And then it seems, it seems like you're foisting a lot of heavy duty meaning on a person just saying, yeah, murder is wrong. To, to say that they have to be referring to this like hyper sophisticated nested group of, of standards and values. The other issue is cultural relativism suffers from something known as a reformer's dilemma. If cultural relativism is true, then it is logically impossible for a society to have a virtuous moral reformer like Gandhi or Dr. King. The idea behind reforms is a culture or society. Well, I guess it, I guess the idea is that the virtues would be judged relative to the culture that adopted those things as virtues then, right? So, you know, we would view them as virtuous, but people at the time wouldn't view them as virtuous. And that seems to be relatively consistent with, you know, the, what history has to say about some of these things as well. Right. It could just be that something was wrong relative to the values that were present at a given time and then they are not wrong relative to whatever the reformer is changing the values to the idea here still seems to be that sort of smuggled realism or smuggled there's got to be one correct answer here and it could just be that simultaneously the reformers it's right relative to their standards and it's not right relative to the whatever community they're trying to reform um i think that the realist is smuggling in realism here because they want to say that, that the implication here is that reformers we would have to think of the reformer as doing something morally wrong yeah right okay yeah 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 so that seems that seems terrible because we typically support reformers i mean unless someone was trying to reform towards like let's bring back like torturing animals or something uh but that's not typically what's been the case so i think that there's there's a kind of rhetorical maneuver here which is to say hey are you against all the reforms that have made society you know so much better than it was in the past uh, because if you are, that's a, the relativist can't really be in favor of that. The relativist has a problem with that. So I think, yeah, I think it's a, it's no longer going to make the relativist look bad. We're conforming to the objective moral law and therefore needs to change. If cultural relativism is true, then these men were not virtuous. They were in error for going against the cultural moral norms. As Emery's Westacott says, moral relativism seems to imply, for instance, that the majority can never be wrong on moral matters. And a corollary of that is that within a given community, dissidents must always be wrong. So cultural relativism cannot account for reforms or reformers, because to call for moral reform requires a vantage point outside and above the culture's moral norms from which to judge they are wrong. But it is exactly such a vantage point that cultural relativism denies. Even many advocates of moral relativism end up creating an objective standard by promoting the virtue of tolerance. Not all moral relativists, but many preach we must be tolerant of other cultures. This is an underlying foundation for many people holding to moral relativism, that we must be tolerant of different ideas. But the idea of tolerance of different moral views 
is preached as if it is a universal obligation. If relativism is true, then the principle of tolerance doesn't express a transcultural obligation that is binding on everyone. In other words, it is merely an expression of values associated with one culture or relative framework. Pragmatically speaking, if the relative Hang on. <laughs> an expression of values associated with one culture or uh, I was just seeing if it mapped to um IP text with I mean maybe it does. I maybe you would have put I, I I was just seeing if there'd be like a funny one in there or something, but um I don't know, I guess. Maybe India isn't tolerant though. Maybe South America isn't. But then, could you, you know, is is North America tolerant? Well, not exactly of uh, people that they don't like and the values and so forth of. So, I don't know. I was just thinking it could have been funny where the labels land, but <laughs> yeah, relative framework. What pragmatically speaking, if the relativist preaches. Oh, sorry. Did you? out about this is that it and it, there's nothing wrong with making a criticism of relativists and the criticism here seems to be both on the one hand they're relativists and they seem to inconsistently endorse a non-relativist normative moral position fair enough i think that that's true i think some people do get stuck in that inconsistency and it is a legitimate inconsistency it's not an objective to it's not a, an objection to relativism though it's just would an objection to people that hold in positions inconsistent with relativism so it's legitimate to say people hold inconsistent positions. That's a problem. But just keep in mind for anybody viewing this as a critique of relativism, this is not, it's just literally not a critique of relativism. Tolerance should be abided by everyone and everyone should respect different cultural moral views. They are pushing an objectively binding moral value, but they cannot if it is all relative. What if it is someone's cultural norm to reject tolerance and moral views of other cultures? and seek to install their own moral framework on everyone. So basically, if you think everyone should be tolerant of other moral frameworks, you are not promoting relativism, but a universal obligation. These issues and more cause problems for moral relativists and seem to suggest the evidence is pointing towards the idea there is an objective moral reality that is not- This is gonna be similar though to some of the sort of thoughts about the subjectivists and what the what the, the agent um, kind of subjectivist can and can't say about morality and whether they can advocate their own position. I mean, it seems like you could be a cultural relativist, right? And think that that's the true meta-ethical theory, but then also endorse your culture like dominating all the others because you think it's better or something. Like you could just do both. Um, I, I don't really see a problem. You're not, you're, you're not saying that, um, you're just saying that yours your one's better or like you you want everyone to act that way or something like that you're not like committed to some kind of contradictory belief you're just like well, well i'm not a part of that culture so yeah i think like for people in that culture they think it's true but i don't <laughs> right yeah there's nothing inconsistent about the first order normative moral position that everyone should tolerate everybody else you know with exceptions for like tolerating atrocities and stuff like that but people should be generally tolerant of one another that could just be a, a normative moral position you have and you could have it because it's the moral standards of your culture, like your culture, that's the attitude that your culture takes. And you could say that moral claims are true or false relative to the, the cultures to which they are indexed. There's just, there's not an inconsistency there. It looks like he's he's pointing to that though. He's saying it could be part of your cultural standards to impose them on other people. Uh, and insofar as that's true, that's a reason to, I think that's further in his point that it's, consistent with relativism to be both tolerant and intolerant at the normative level. And that's true. But, you know, by the same token, the relativist could just say, yeah, I'm not a realist about rel uh, tolerance. I'm a relativist about tolerance, and that's not a problem. Not defined by cultures, societies, or individuals. Relativism may be popular among modern laymen, but it suffers from serious logical difficulties that simply cannot be ignored. Okay, I think that's pretty much it then, Lens. Um, two hours, 15 minutes. What do you say? Are you, sa are you satisfied with <laughs> apologetics and moral relativism and subjectivist positions and what, they have to, what apologists have to say about them? I, I feel like I could be more concise about these. I don't know if people are going to, if people were really into a two hour analysis of like 20 minutes of video. Uh, but I don't know. There's a lot to say about this stuff. Did you want to discuss questions or anything in the chat? Or is that something? I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, if, if people have questions, um, feel free to put them through now. I saw some um, questions earlier. I didn't want to sidetrack to address them. So if people have questions, I could I could try. I could also do the other thing that I've done before, which is I just make a comment, and then you pen it, and then I could address the comment.
comments afterwards. Yeah, we can we can we can do that. Um, I'm just saying. Hang on. So, how do you support their view when it is? And I, I don't know what that's in response to. So, I don't know whose view and what they mean by antithetical. Yeah, antithetical to what? Um, Lance thinks there is a rhetorical move here. He hasn't, however, offered an argument for that claim, I think. So this is the, um, what you said is the, the kind of rhetorical move of, I think this was when you were saying people assuming uh, moral realism. I yeah, I don't, I don't know what it would mean to say I haven't offered an argument. I don't think that observations and hypotheses and, and suppositions about what may or may not be the case must necessarily be presented in the formal logical form or else they're like what then we just reject them seems plausible to me i don't know what kind of evidence we would be able to get uh if people are, are engaged in this rhetorical move uh, i mean one thing would be psychological facts about the motivations or inclinations of the people using these arguments that i don't think we would have access to especially after the fact if it's something written in print or in an older video i don't think people would necessarily be consciously doing this so you know, I don't think that people presenting these sorts of arguments are themselves aware of whether there is some they're they're sort of benefiting or exploiting some sort of rhetorical advantages uh, built into the argument. And so, what you might want to do is empirical research on how people respond to the argument. Do they find it persuasive? Why do they find it persuasive? And there may be ways of, for instance, in principle, you could present the kinds of like that premise. I think it was five in the Cameron video you could sort of disambiguate it or sort of translate it into the subjectivist terms and then give people the translated version and the non-translated version and then see how they respond and then see if there's differences in the amount of people to find the argument convincing and then look at the, the reactions to their explanations for why they find it convincing or not. There's going to be a whole bunch of problems with doing this, though. It's going to be very difficult to do that using the standard survey format that's used in moral psychology. And it would even be difficult to do this in a sort of structured or semi-structured interview format because people are you're going to have a lot of difficulties with people understanding what you're asking them so the empirical empirical tractability of detecting these sorts of rhetorical maneuvers even when they do occur uh is significant it's like hard to find out and um, one thing to say about this is that i actually do empirical research on this so i will actually will take statements that reflect realism and anti-realism and and claims that people make in the vicinity of meta-ethics, and I will give them to, in some cases, hundreds of people, in other cases, you know, maybe just a few dozen, and then look at how people respond to those sorts of statements, and then look for, are people interpreting these statements or questions or whatever in the way that the person asking the question is intending to? This is not something typically done by people in meta-ethics. They just assume people know what they mean, or they're not attempting to say things that are intended to be understood by lay people. So, you know, I already do work on this where, you know, to a certain extent. So this is the kind of thing that in principle I could do empirical research on, but it'd be tough to do. Um, I don't think that that invalidates the legitimacy of floating the possibility that a rhetorical move is going on here. So there's uh, a couple more questions for you. Um, do you agree with Sam Harris and the biological determinism structure? Uh, what problems do you think we have with it outside of the empirical problem of psychology? Is that that's for me? I'm, I'm biological. Well, yeah, actually, it could be for me, and I've just it, I don't think it is. So I think I've just been tagged to highlight it to my attention as a question. Um, so I don't know what the claim is. Like I know that uh, Harris is a determinist. Uh, well, he's at the very least an incompatibilist. Uh, yeah, I don't it's really to figure out what biological determinism in this question means. I guess. Um, yeah. So I don't think that like biological facts determine everything about people because obviously there's a cultural and environmental input. So I, I'm not sure if they clarify, try addressing the question. And maybe that's what they mean by the empirical problem of psychology, or do they mean it's difficult to reduce um, psychological theories to biological facts or something? I Maybe that could be the, what the question's getting at. Either way, I mean, I, I'm I'm not quite sure what's meant, but I'm at least quite happy to say I'm not a biological determinist as well. So, um, yeah. Where is the other one? Ah, here we go. 
How does Lance avoid anti-realism about metaphysics after having accepted anti-realism about morality? Uh, well, one, I wouldn't, I'm not quite sure what anti-realism about metaphysics is exactly, but I'm, I'm also, I guess the second thing would be, I'm not sure why, what the relationship is. Like if I, if you reject moral realism, are you stuck rejecting realism about metaphysics? If so, why? I guess I just wonder what their, their idea would, behind that would be. Yeah, like I don't, I don't think there'd be any inconsistency, right, with saying, um, okay, I don't, I don't think there are any like mind independent um, truth apt moral facts, but like I think there's es essential natures of things in the world, and like you know some of the sciences discover those or something, and then you'd be like a realist about some aspects of metaphysics, anti-realist about others. Um, I mean, like uh, Aristotelian realists, right, are anti-realists with respect to uh, Platonism, so. Um, it's like, yeah, what one doesn't kind of entail the other. So Schuvert comment for appealing to psychology, nature, nurture for morality. I'm still a little bit unsure, but maybe that has helped you understand the question. Yeah, I just, I don't, I, there's some people that have written some pretty good papers about this. So I don't really think that there's there's like a nature nurture dichotomy and that either independently contributes to human psychology. I just think that's co-determined. And so I kind of just reject that there's there's a substantive dichotomy there. Uh, Suzette asks, how does our epistemic relationship to the external world differ from our epistemic relationship to external morality? Well, I guess you just don't think that there is external morality. Oh, well, maybe her idea then is that there'd have to be a different epistemology for morality and other kinds of things if if your defeaters for morality weren't to undercut. It, maybe that's how she's thinking about it. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing to say about this is that if I had if I had to be an anti-realist, like I'm not going to accept moral realism, be, like because I don't want to give up realism about something else. I'll just give up realism about everything. I don't think realism is moral realism is viable, like at all. And if that pushes me all the way towards some sort of like extreme anti-realism or global skepticism or something, okay. Like if, if that element of denying moral realism, that's fine with me. Um, I'm not going to accept moral realism by someone trying to drag other things, you know, there people that want to drag up realism along with everything else. No, I'll just drag everything else down with it if I have to. I just don't think there's good reasons to be a moral realist. I would need to see good ar arguments and I need to see an intelligible account of what realists are talking about. I haven't seen one. I, I mean, one uh, uh, one difference is that descriptions of the external world strike me as intelligible. Uh, the descriptions of whatever realists are talking about don't strike me as intelligible. And so at the very least, what I could say is that I can make sense of external world claims and I can't make sense of external moral claims. I just don't know what they're talking about. Uh, but that's just describing sort of my phenomenology or the, the sort of my personal standpoint on the matter. It would be like if someone said, hey, there are tables and there are florpedorps. And you know, okay, I know what a table is, so sure, maybe there's tables. Uh, and if someone goes, there's florpedorps and they go, well, what are those? And they go, I can't tell you it's primitive. It's a primitive concept, either get it or you don't. Okay, well, I don't. So. Yeah, so now no tables for you, Lance. <laughs> right, so so I don't get to say there's tables because I don't know what yeah. this person's talking about. Like, I, I just don't see why I have to abandon the rest of my beliefs because someone else thinks that there's a thing that I don't think is meaningful. So, like, like can I just say to realists, like, you have to abandon realism unless you accept, and then I just find an alien from some other planet that believes in, you know, Zorpian facts about what you zot and zot not <laughs> do? Yeah. Uh, and unless you, because I think the appropriate response is, well, what does it mean that you sought to do something? And then, you know, the alien just says it's primitive. And unless you accept that there are zots and that there are zoral facts, you have to reject external the external world. You can't believe there's tables and chairs unless you believe in zots. That doesn't seem to me any different than what moral realists are doing. It just seems like realists want to, they do this, this piggyback maneuver where they want to just say, look, you've, you've got to accept realism. And if you don't, you have to reject everything else. And... I, I don't think that I do. Right. Okay, so last uh, <laughs> question, I think. Uh, Lance needs to accept realism because God exists. Yeah, I don't think realism would follow from God existing. Like, I don't think God solves the problem that realists have where... So, like, my position is when I, when I deal with moral realism is I tend to say that there's a sort of a... 
trilemma or like there's like a tripartite uh, division in how one might respond to a realist account, which is that realist accounts tend to be trivial, false, or unintelligible. They Those are not necessarily mutually, like something could be trivial and false, I guess, like it could be false and then it would be trivial if it were true, but it's not. Uh, so part of the issue is that I don't think that the conventional non-naturalist accounts of realism are intelligible. And so in that case, if someone wants to say like, if God existed, like, boom, you get realism for free, what is it that you're getting? Like, I'm still not sure what that is. So I don't know that that follows. It would be like if someone's saying, if God exists, then there are Florbridors. Uh, are there? I don't know. I still don't know what that is. So I don't know if that follows. So it's the same issue. I like, I just don't think God gets you realism. Yeah, I, I certainly do struggle with um, theists not really providing um, what I consider to be plausible accounts of how things like, you know, God's commandments or if it's not supposed to be a divine command theory like these facts that are supposed to be literally identical to god's existence right um how they somehow supervene then on like states of affairs and then interact with like my mind and i meant to grasp them some it, it's like a very difficult um relationship that's supposed to be going on between all of these different entities that i just kind of yes. don't get like if you have theism, it's, you could just say, look, moral facts are just facts about what God commands you to do. And there are facts of that kind. So therefore, like there are moral facts. Uh, my concern with that is that if they're if they don't have an irreducibly normative element to them, then they're just going to be a certain kind of descriptive fact. So it could, like there could yeah. be a God and it could be that God commands me to torture babies for fun. OK, no, I don't want to. Uh, so I'm, I'm just I don't I'm not going to. Now what? So you could say, well, then God will punish you. Well, okay, well, let's get, you know, that matters in a way that's contingent on my goals and interests. So I have, I, you could say, I wouldn't say this, but you could say I have stance dependent reasons to care about like punishment, but right. okay. Supposing you remove all of those sorts of prudential and stance dependent considerations. Okay. I have a stance independent reason to do what God says. Like, do I, because then you're go going, you're going to get right back to the problem that I have with those accounts of realism, which is what does that mean? And I haven't been given an account of what that means. So adding God to the picture doesn't solve the problem that it may be the case that these sorts of stance independent accounts that involve this like irreducible normativity just are not intelligible. Like they don't mean anything. Um, and if they do, I don't know that God gets that, gives you that, or that that's going to help you very much. In other words, I just think that this issue of God existing doesn't make the case for realism any easier or not possibly not any more difficult. So just if there's a good account of like irreducible normativity or stance independent moral facts, I just don't think it's going to turn on whether God exists or not. If there if there is one, it seems just as plausible to me that there would be a secular basis for presenting it, maybe more plausible. I don't know. Okay. Um, I think you're running out because it's 10, 10 p.m. for me here, but crazy. Like what time does it go dark for you, by the way, Lance, where you are? Uh, nine maybe nine okay so 10 p.m here and it's still kind of pretty bright outside i don't know if you can if you can sort of it's see because yeah because yeah, i'm so because i you know in, in glasgow right so it's pretty northern up and it, get, it goes dark at like um half 10 or something at the minute which is kind of it's a bit oh. crazy for me anyway yeah but and then right. the, the sun rises really early but <laughs> yeah i'll put um if uh, only if you want to um i can pin like a questions comment to the top and you can yeah, uh, yeah if you want to pin that so it's like official from you then i i could try to do my best to respond to people in in the comment section because i feel like i see a bunch of chat so maybe people have more questions and we just don't have time to deal with them no problem well thank you for giving up your time though lens to uh review this with me i appreciate it um yeah have you got any other debates or or anything coming up that you want to promote for people no. here no. cool Okay, well, no problem. Thank you anyway, and thank you everyone for watching. Um, that is it.